it and you just click that you accept it and now we are being recorded. So hello and welcome back after a longish Easter break to our lecture series climate change through the lens of an inter and transdisciplinary project climate walk in case you forgot which lecture or which online class you are <laughs> sitting in now. Um, I will remind you of some important organizational matters again. So during the sessions, your microphones and your cameras are deactivated. In case you want to pose a question or add a comment, then please do so through the chat. So you are all able to access the chat and uh, to write comments and questions there. Um, we are going to moderate the chat together with my colleague Martin and yeah Martin actually now it's your time already to do a recap on this lecture series and remind us where we are on our path. Yes hello also a very warm welcome from my side as there are already three weeks now lying between today and our last class a quick re recap is needed we think. So last time we had four very brilliant speakers, actually three of them with the background in physical geography and one sociologist doing research on environmental migration, actually. Our first speaker last time was Jew ecologist Stefan Glatzel, who spoke about the importance of conserving and restoring peatlands as the drainage is still a considerable driver of climate change and ecological devastation. So we got to know a little bit about what peatlands are and, and also to my surprise, peatlands are ecologically really, really important ecosystems. We then also had Jan Radetzky from the University of Ostrava talking about already visible impacts and effects of climate change in the Czech Carpathians. After the break, we had Thomas Glade who presented key aspects of studying environmental risks and more generally also the coupling of environmental um, and societal um, systems. Last but not least, we had also Lore van Praag, who spoke about environmental migration, about difficulties of defining the category climate refugees, and about efforts and challenges to make environment, environmental migration and also climate change related flight part of international laws and treaties. So while last class was actually all about climate change related research perspectives in today's class, we will deal with questions of how to transform the sometimes quite abstract talk of climate change into concrete practices. We will focus on how to encourage and support global citizenship in favor of climate action and in favor also of a fundamental socio-ecological transformation. So today's class is explicitly linked to the education pillar of our project, to the project dimension we talk. Um, we are well aware that climate action, education and global citizenship is not primarily about talking. Um, in fact, it is all about it is it is not all about telling people what to do about, you know, simply conveying a message what is right and what is wrong. Rather, as we will hear today um, from our wonderful speakers, Climate action education is about inspiring and supporting people to educate themselves, about creating safe spaces for experience and knowledge exchange, and also about a different kind of storytelling, we would say. So we are especially looking forward to today's class as we have uh, managed to leave behind at least more than the last times the narrow confines of academia. We have um, very interesting guests today from the Ban Ki-moon Center, from the University of Antwerp, from WWF Generation Earth, and also from the Donauauen National Park. On that note, I will stop here and hand back over to Ria, who will introduce our first guest speaker today. Yes, I'm indeed very happy to introduce our first guest of the day. Uh, she is the CEO for the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, Monika Fröhler. Welcome today. So Monika Fröhler um, is CEO of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, and she is a passionate change maker, advocate, founder and speaker. She was entrusted to create the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens after working at the United Nations in Geneva, in New York and Vienna, the EU, the Austrian Foreign Ministry and in field missions around the globe. She is passionate about the implementation of the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement 
Throughout her career, she managed to support hundreds of women, young people and communities all over the globe. For example, working in Africa and Latin America to ban landmines, working to improve hospital care in rural Central Asia and Africa, assisting in eco-friendly city planning in Asia and bettering the living conditions for women in the Middle East and West Africa. So thank you very much for being here today and we really look forward to your talk and the microphone and the presentation space is now yours for the next 30 minutes. Thank you so much, Ria. Thank you, Martin. And thanks to the overall audience. I see that we are 43, which is a great number for an afternoon like this, where you are surely coming out of Zoom meetings one after the other. I'm happy that you connect about the issue of climate action because it's seriously dear to my heart and it's seriously at the core of the mission of the Ban Ki-moon Center. You might know the name of Ban Ki-moon and let's start with the next slide immediately because I need to tell you obviously as CEO of the Ban Ki-moon Center who Ban Ki-moon is and what we are all about. So we are a quasi-international organization based in Vienna and we are led by the former Secretary General of the United Nations together with his good old friend, Heinz Fischer, who you probably know as our 11th federal president of Austria. So the two gentlemen agreed quite from the outset of founding this institution that they want to build on the legacy of Ban Ki-moon. And the legacy of Ban Ki-moon is very much defined by first, the sustainable development goals, and secondly, the Paris Climate Agreement. And then it was also clear building on that is only feasible and possible and really effective if you are empowering women and youth. And how to do that? Ban Ki-moon has this vantage point of saying we need more global citizens around the globe, hence the name of the center. And what does it mean to be a global citizen? It really means that you know about the SDGs, you have knowledge of the Sustainable Development Goals, you do possess 21st century skills, and you abide by global citizen values. And that doesn't mean that one value set of any region of the world is superseding another value set, but it is definitely coined by the human, the, the human rights declaration and by principles enshrined even in the preamble of the United Nations Charter. So peaceful and prosperous world, leaving no one behind is sort of in a nutshell what the mandate is. So, our work at the Ban Ki-moon Center is guided by the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement. Next slide. We do that in four big areas. Leadership, we support leadership. Education, we are spreading education on the SDGs and on global citizenship education. Um, we do that with huge advocacy platforms. So we are standing on the shoulders of giants, I like to say, because we have from the scouts to global citizen to other big consortia that are helping us to spread the news. And we are very keen on involving young people, but also women into global peace initiatives at the level at par with those that traditionally are in these kind of efforts in conflict prevention, but also then actually peace building after a conflict has happened. Next slide. So, I want to use today's talk very much to go with you into the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of what we are talking about when we are talking about climate action. I know you're a very informed audience and some of you will be probably lawyers, but needless to say, sometimes it's good to take a glimpse on what does the Paris Climate Agreement that we are working for with the mindset of global citizenship, what does it actually say? And which kind of goals are we pursuing? And many of you will have read, but here I want to highlight what's underlined on that slide, what we are all working towards in various shapes and forms and with our own means is to hold the increase of global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And at this stage, would we all be in a classroom? I would ask you, so who knows what pre-industrial level actually means? And I encourage you write in the chat, what does pre-industrial actually mean? So what date are we talking here? Do you know that? Um, so have, have a chance at guessing and the first one who gets it right has sort of the honor of being the listener of today. So before we clarify what pre-industrial levels is, if you, no one is daring to write anything in the chat, people write something in the chat. Let's go to the next slide. 
Um, because indeed, not only do we look at a temperature target, which we all know, but we are also looking at the long-term goal of the emissions. And indeed, no one is guessing what pre-industrial means. I, my chat doesn't show anything yet. So, okay, big revelation without you daring to make a bet. Pre-industrial means uh, 1850. So the UNFCCC and the negotiators actually established the year 1850 as the benchmark year of pre-industrialization. And hence we are calculating from these levels, the, the temperature uh, decrease or the, the non-increase that we are aiming at. Long-term goal, a long-term emission goal is uh, very much that we, as the wording says, we managed to peak global greenhouse gas emissions um, and we managed to peak them as fast as possible um, to, to basically have the balance that is to achieve the balance between emissions and sinks. And all of you will know that sinks can occur naturally with sequestering and with basically natural phenomena. But of course, we are emitting more than can be naturally absorbed. So effectively, it means reaching net zero emissions or emission neutrality. And then some of you will be involved so much that you have seen the, the seal very consciously of the 100% carbon neutral or 100% CO2 neutral. And I want to uh, shed a light on the fact that actually 100% carbon neutral is not the same, obviously, as emission neutrality. Emission neutrality is a far higher goal because emissions are not only CO2 emissions, and we will look at all of them in the course of this, of this small talk. Um, we, CO2 is important, and it's the, the big chunk of the greenhouse gas emissions that we are talking about, but it's not the complete deal. So the moment companies, and it's often companies, put in their uh, CSR policies or in their, in their uh, sustainability policies that they just want to become 100% CO2 neutral, that's fine at the first step, but we really are looking at emission neutrality. So there is a huge difference. One is definitely higher ranking than the other. Next slide. So there is, we have a temperature goal, we have this um, long-term goal, we have a finance goal that is enshrined in the Paris Climate Agreement, which is really uh, the agreement places a legal obligation on the developed countries to contribute financially. And that legal obligation is even, there, there's a number put to it that was difficult to negotiate, and it's the number of the 100 billion US dollars per year. It's an aspirational goal, but that was the target. And uh, it should be done on an annual basis, obviously, but definitely prior to 2025. And indeed, of course, you can imagine not all of that money has been made available. So there is a long way to go. And with the US dropping out of the Paris Climate Agreement and with other conundrums happening, this goal is not yet reached. When it comes to the when it comes to further sort of um, understanding the the obligation that is put on a country, you have to always know about the so-called NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, where countries are volunteering what they will do towards mitigation. As you see in the headline, the climate agreement is also on mitigation, but also on adaptation. So what they will do is enshrined in the NDC, and um, it is them, it's up to them to pursue policies with the aim of achieving their climate uh, pledges, which of course some say it's lukewarm, some say it's not tough enough, and to have nationally determined contributions also means where is your, your system of checks and balances. But what was important to get at all to an agreement in Paris in 2015 was that we had differentiated responsibilities recognized, because obviously developed countries can take more on their shoulders uh, and are responsible for far more than developing countries are. So we are really looking to, we shall strive to write long-term low emission strategies by 2020, but we are taking into account the differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Some of them should be leveled out by the 100 billion, but as the 100 billion are not necessarily coming in, it's a bit of a tricky one. Here, uh, next slide, here we have mentioned mitigation already, but of course there is also the big topic, and you will see that at the bottom half of the slide, of adaptation. When you're looking at 100% of climate finance, for now it's still the heavy weight of the climate finance goes to mitigation. So these are the efforts to mitigate the, the, the temperature to basically not reach the two degrees, to keep it at the 1.5 degrees. Um, 
The adaptation means, as you surely know, that we adapt to the already existing climate hazards, to the circumstances that we are already confronted with. And the climate walkers will be a case in point of showcasing how in Europe, in the various regions, in the very various climatic regions, we are adapting. And they will hopefully gather stories from the ground of how much we already need to, to look out for not worsening the situation. So, the deal sets out flexible rules on reporting for countries. I mentioned that, and it's the nationally determined contributions that we are talking here. And we have a facilitative, non-intrusive, non-punitive system of reviews. And again, some claim this is toothless, it's a toothless tiger, but indeed that was the maximum of compromise that could be achieved in 2015. And particularly for the biggest emitters, this of course is already better than nothing. Um, the, as I said, adaptation, the Ban Ki-moon Center is very much engaged into adaptation and we believe more people have to know about adaptation, particularly in the global south, because they are the hardest hit and small island states are hard hit. And so to get young interest, activists interest into adaptation, you will see later on is one of our goals. Next slide. So where do we stand in matters of Paris Climate Agreement and the ratification? As of March 2021, 194 states and the European Union have signed the agreement and the EU and 190 states have ratified and acceded to the agreement. You know, signing is the first step, ratification is the second step, it needs to go through parliament or various governmental structures, including India and China, which are the first and the third largest CO2 emitters that the UNFCCC has identified or that are members of the UNFCCC. And fortunately, with the Biden administration, the US is, has now rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement. Next slide. So let's look at above the, the natural sinks that the world has. Humankind, unfortunately, contributes approximately, and numbers really vary, about 35 billion tons of uh, CO2. And I'm here talking just CO2 emissions per year. If you're looking at all of the emissions, all of the greenhouse gas emissions, the number is far higher. But this scale that I depict here, you see the year 1850. So that's the year of the pre-industrial um, temperature, pretty much. And you see it up to 2017, who is emitting how much. And what's interesting is when people sometimes in Austria are approached and, and people argue, well, what does it make? What kind of difference does it make if we are as small Austria or as small Switzerland or as small whatever contributing by not using this and that and the other, like fossil fuel or our, yeah. And it does contribute because what you see is with the EU 28, the whole yellow bit at the very bottom and EU other, actually with that area to, to count it together, we are one of the, in Europe, we are one of the biggest contributors to the annual total CO2 emissions. As much as the United States, and of course you see China taking a big wedge, um, Asia and Pacific, smaller, India, although it's a country that will surely see still a boost in economic growth, you'll see as a, as a smaller share. And the whole of Africa, even tinier than the whole of India. Next slide. So the biggest emitters of greenhouse gas globally, statistically, it's proven it's China, it's the US, it's India, it's Russia, Japan, Germany, Iran, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, and Canada. So all uh, quite well to do economies, emerging economies, and that's probably no surprise to you, and it shouldn't be a blame shaming game here, but just to be aware where most of the work will need to be done to really get our grips on the on, the, on global warming. Next slide. So we are talking about global greenhouse gas emissions. Now I'm jumping, sometimes I'm talking just carbon, sometimes I'm talking about the overall emissions. Here I'm talking about all of the greenhouse gas emissions. So by economic sector, it's particularly electricity and heat production that has a quarter, literally, of the 100%. Agriculture, forestry, and other land use contributes also almost a quarter to the, to the emissions. Buildings, although many are not yet insulated, only 6% worldwide, transportation 14, industry in itself 21, and other energy uh, 10%. Next slide. So this whole carbon emission question that many of you probably have solved already, but just to point it out once more. Yes, carbon dioxide has the lion's share of the greenhouse gas effect because it's counting for 65% with fossil fuels and with industrial processes. 
Together with the carbon dioxide from forestry and other land use, this amounts up to even 77% of the overall pie. But we shouldn't forget the exacerbating factors are also coined by methane. And here, all of you probably know it's about um, particularly meat production. Nitrous oxides, and many of you will associate fertilizers with that, and F gases. That's only 2%, but the F gases are really evilish, I'd say. They are found in air conditioners and in refrigeration. And as long as we don't get them right, we too are failing for our mandate of lowering the, the emission danger that is currently there. Next slide. So what does all of this have to do with the SDGs? How is that connected? You know the SDGs. Uh, the SDG 13 climate action is the one that many of us believe is at the core of many of our actions. And indeed the Paris Climate Agreement with all of the legalistic terms that we have now gone through, plus the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals taken together, they work in synergy. Next slide. I say this, they work in synergy because the, of course the Paris Climate Agreement gives us an even more concise way of how to approach temperature rises. But the SDGs delineate what needs to be done in the various strata of our being together as humankind, what we can do. So in the biospheric strata, we see the goal 13 represented, but also other biospheric goals that literally lay the groundwork for society and economy to function. In the case of society, as you know, society has to reform to live up to the Paris Climate Agreement. And here you have the goals um, of, for example, quality education, which we as Ban Ki-moon Center believe strongly is a key. Youth needs to be informed about climate. Youth needs to be active, and not only youth, but also up to the elderly generation. But the hope is that young leaders will actually pick up the, pick up the chance because they are the first ones that understands, it seems, and the last generation that can do something about it. And then you have in the top strata, the economy that obviously is dependent on the well-being of the biosphere and definitely linked to societal measures. Here we are talking about trying to create uh, jobs, green jobs that are actually helping the environment rather than, than harming it. Next slide. So if we look at the targets that are formulated under SDG goal number 13, the targets range from one to three, and then we have 13A and 13B as well. And they are about strengthening resilience and adaptive capacity for climate related disasters. I already spoke about that a bit. Um, it's also about integrating climate change measures into policy and planning. So we know that this is in the Paris Climate Agreement as well. Countries need to have policies and planning ready and hopefully also funds that come that way. And then it's also about capacity building and building knowledge to meet the, the climate change challenge. And of course, implementing what the UNFCCC has laid out in their framework. And you can see target 13A literally as a code for the 100 billion. So that's the, the core of, of, of the financial possibility to have the 100 billion donated by developed countries for the betterment of, of the world, but particularly developing countries. And then promoting mechanisms to raise capacity for climate planning and management, what should be written in the aftermath here, because this is targeted particularly at youth and women. So we are looking at raising capacity for youth and women to contribute to the fulfillment of, of the target, because they're so often marginalized and not part of the goal. So next slide. When we look at women, let's look at just three facts. It's a bit of a convoluted slide, but three of the things that I would like to highlight. Yes, we are witnessing increasing temperatures. Yes, sea levels are already rising. And unfortunately, glaciers are melting and we are witnessing the loss of biodiversity. Now, what does that do? Or how are women part of that game at all? Um, and unfortunately, women are typically not included in decisions and here it's even extrapolated in the management of coastal and marine resources, but I could also very well argue in decisions on management of soil, in decisions on um, property rights, in decisions on what, what kind of seeds to plant somewhere, they often are not officially included. They make the decisions maybe in their own little, uh, in their own little village, 
but it's not that they have the same representatorial rights. And what you see yet at the very bottom of the slide is that women working in the agricultural and related activities are heftily a majority, so above 60%, while women holding the land, being the land holders, is marginal. We are talking about a bit over 11%, 11 to 14%, depending on where you look. Next slide. So it's a fact, and I'm preaching to the converted, I'm sure that we see global temperature rise. Um, we see greenhouse gas concentrations that have increased. CO2 is right now at 403 parts per million. Um, also, the, we, talk, we talked about the nitrous oxide and also the methane parts per million are, are way above the levels that we have ever witnessed. Ocean acidification increasing, ocean warming getting worse and worse. Next slide. Um, sea levels. We, have, we see a continuous rise in sea levels. The cryosphere, so Arctic and Antarctic, we are seeing them shrink. And that's at a certain point, a tipping point, irreversible. And we are, we are approaching that at like lightning speed, so to say. Next slide. We are all aware extreme weather events are increasingly happening. So we are talking about hurricanes. We are talking about heat, heat waves worldwide about um, wildfires. And uh, these are stats from up, up to 2019, but unfortunately, even with the COVID reduction of international travel and with emissions, we are not, we are not close in shifting the needle, although activity has actually been scaled down. Next slide. This is one of my favorite slides, slides because it comes from information is beautiful and I can only advise all of you to check it out. They have a way of presenting difficult topics quite, quite explicitly. What do we see here? We see how many gigatons of, again, carbon dioxide. So we are shifting back from the emissions to just carbon dioxide. We have um, still as a potential to release. So we have released to date from pre-industrial levels, so 1850 to 1999, we have released 1,010 gigatons of CO2 as humankind throughout all this period. What we have released from 2000 to 2015, when the Paris Climate Agreement was finally agreed, is 500 gigatons. So half of that long lifespan of, of overall number in the, in the first instance. So what we, have, we, can, what we can safely release still is a carbon budget, and that will be referred to at many times, of 335 gigatons. Now, we know that per year we are emitting 36 gigatons of just CO2 above the levels that the Earth can, can take, can sink, basically, which leaves us with a carbon budget of eight years where we can safely emit what we are currently emitting. And then you have these uh, boxes of, of orange to the, to the right of the slide, where you see that there is lots of CO2 still in the ground in fossil fuel reserves, in remaining company reserves, and in state-owned reserves. So there is lots that we could still actually, um, unfortunately, release. Next slide. What would that mean? We have been talking about the temperature increase. So if global warming increases by just 0.8 degrees, what this, this, that's a scenario that has, is already happening. We are talking about an ocean acidification of increase of 30% and more severe heat waves. If we are talking about the level of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which seems to be inevitable, uh, the sea levels will rise to 0 0.8 meters. We are looking at corals in the way that they are stopping to grow. And we will use 10% of our corn and wheat yields that are currently planted given current conditions. Two degrees, the safe limit, we are looking at sea level rise of 1.4 meters. Cities like Amsterdam would be underwater. We are looking at corals that are bleached white. We are looking that every, every euro summer will like, we'll see a heat wave and we would lose 20% of our yield when it comes to harvest. If we are reaching the tipping point, we have a sea level rise of 1.2 meters. Cities like New York would be in danger. You have the corals dead and Italy, Spain and Greece would actually be equivalent to what we consider now as deserts and our corn and wheat yields 
would be reduced by 30 to 40 percent. And I will not dwell on the scenario of five, five degrees because I guess many of us, all of us, are working that we will not have to see that happen, the nightmare. Next slide. So fortunately, not to end on a sort of sad note, I want to end on a very positive note because global citizenship mindset means that you're taking the ownership of doing something about the problem that you spotted. And definitely climate action is one of the key issues. So those of you who don't yet know Project Drawdown, I can highly recommend that you check them out. They have invested into research about the 100 best solutions to reverse global warming by 2050. They looked at 100 potentials um, that can draw down CO2, but also other emissions from the atmosphere. And what's interesting is that their findings are varied. And I would like next slide to present to you some, some that might surprise you. You have a big violet segment uh, of refrigeration. And you might remember that I spoke about the F gases before. So this is actually not only refrigeration, but also air conditioning, because these gases, although they were just 2% of the emission slice, they are uh, exacerbating factors. They're amplifiers of the greenhouse gas effect. And so if we get our refrigeration, and I mean the recycling and even the labeling and the, the, the sort of the whole value chain right for refrigerators and air conditions, we are doing a lot for drawing down. Wind turbines seem to be super effective. They even get a higher uh, percentage than solar farms. And when you look at combining reducing food waste and plant-rich diet, you have an amazing segment. So indeed, by changing our ways of nutrition, we can do a lot. What is surprising, and actually on that scale, doesn't show that, that evidently, but if you go to the pink segment where it says educating girls and family planning, if you account for it in the project drawdown files, you will see that these two segments combined are the biggest single share of what you can do to reduce uh, climate hazards. And that sounds counterintuitive, educating girls and family planning, why, why, why? And fact is that this is the measure to stop population increase at the levels that we are anticipating now until 2050. And only if we manage to stop population increase, uh, exponential uh, population increase, and that can be done by educating girls and introducing family planning, we will manage it all to keep certain levels um, at a, a status where it's still palatable for our, for our planet. So there are many measures. I can only recommend to you to look at them next slide. But as I need to finish up, what does the Ban Ki-moon Center, how do we translate that kind of knowledge, that kind of energy that we have from the, from the Paris Climate Agreement, from the SDGs, how do we translate that into our everyday action? So our Monday morning tasks, and there are some bullets that I want to illustrate. We are working with the Gates Foundation on elevating agricultural adaptation. How do we do that? We talk to particularly governments but also international organizations to support women, smallholder farmers, to be more resilient to climate hazards. We try to train young women in a young women leadership adaptation program together with the Global Center on Adaptation with the so-called Mission 4.7 and UNESCO and a couple of others, including Columbia University. We see that the SDGs, we try that the SDGs and knowledge about them and action with them, for them, is enshrined in all school systems worldwide. That's a humongous task, but um, it's, it needs to be done within the next couple of years. Then, of course, we too are, are sitting on several boards, including the Austrian World Summit, the Federation of International Automobiles, Transport. We have seen how much transport is actually an emitter. We are part of the Vienna Energy Forum, and we are very proud to be a knowledge association partner of the Climate Walk, so of the board of the Climate Walk project with the wonders of a changing world. Next slide. And to the core of our actions, and I will, I think, close with that, are our SDG micro projects. We are, we are happy to work with young, ambitious activists fellows, mentees, scholars who are Ban Ki-moon Center related because they work with us on these projects in our various lines of educational programs. These fellows, mentees and scholars, 
they spot, they come from Afghanistan, from Kenya, from Mongolia, from Bahrain, from Oman, from Europe, from, from Korea, from America, from Latin America. They spot a challenge, see a solution and act upon it. And we call that SDG micro projects and we accompany them. They vary in size and in concept, but we accompany them through it, mentor them through it, connect them to people. And three that I would like to just give you as samples that have really worked well, where for example, Project AgriSpace that aims to achieve SDG 2 to end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition. And it was done by Ruvimbo Samanga in Zimbabwe and is still going on. We have an amazing project on Recycle Up by one of our scholars, Al Hassan Baba Minuri, no, sorry, Muniru, I should get better with their second names because I'm always just referring to them in the first name. So Recycle Up in Ghana is an amazing incubator that develops social entrepreneurs really to um, create chances for the youth to engage in, in recycling activities, again, throughout the whole chain. And the WISE initiative, the Women's in, uh, Initiative for Sustainable Energy, also focuses on increasing women's participation in the renewable energy sector, and that's done in Afghanistan by Horia. And I will spare you from me pronouncing her full name. Next slide. If you are interested in more on climate justice, on the themes that I have touched upon, then please tune in. Currently, we are running a session on climate justice webinars, a series where we are working together with the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. And in seven episodes with very diverse speakers are looking at what can academia, policymakers, civil society, international organization representatives, but particularly young climate activists do for an intersectional and feminist climate action approach. And there will be a policy briefing paper at the end of it, of course, with recommendations. And it's fascinating interactions that are taking place at these webinars. So the next one is on 21st of April, 11 o'clock. Um, that's the link. You can also find it on our website. And please be cordially invited to tune in. And with that, I'm coming, I think, to an end. Next slide of my presentation. I want to thank you and want to encourage you to be global citizens, and I'm sure you are already, who act with passion and compassion on the topics at hand. We have one plan A, and that's the SDGs. We don't have a plan B. And we have one planet A, and that's our Earth, and we don't have the planet B. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Monica, for this um, great lecture. And thank you also for reminding us all about the current situation that we are actually in with our world and also making it in, uh, like, you know, explaining it to us in such an understandable way. And also, I was really happy to be reminded that these micro level projects really make a difference and, and that they matter. Um, and I took a lot of notes and a lot of questions, but I can see already that one student has posed a question in the chat room. So I will keep mine here. So for all the students uh, who have been listening, you can now start writing your uh, questions or your comments into the chat and I will read them out loud and we'll start with Tikla. Sharon who writes, do the different emission gases have the same effect on climate change? Uh, for example, if we reduce one gigaton of CO2, is it the same effect as reducing one gigaton of methane from a climate change perspective? Are there different targets of reduction per gas type? So a very technical question. That is a cool technical question. And I have to admit, I can't with all sincerity answer it uh, appropriately. I would have to consult on this one. What I do know is that the, the targets indeed for the various gases, yes, they vary incredibly, particularly when you're looking at it from a legal perspective. For example, for the F gases that I mentioned, the refrigeration and the, um, and the air conditioning, there is the so-called Kigali protocol. And the Kigali protocol rules these gases out, the particularly the poisonous ones, 
um, for countries right now that can afford it. So the European Union has put itself already under quite a stringent regime uh, observing the Kigali protocol and basically getting rid of uh, harmful F gases altogether with producing refrigeration. And then also, you know, that we get the certificate of this is an A kind of refrigerator and we tend to, tend to buy nothing anymore that is labeled as C or D or, or because European Union can afford it. But the Kigali protocol has a different um, legal frame for developing countries because they can't yet have the full recycling capacity that the developed countries have. So indeed, yes, by, from country to country, targets are different. The overall goal of reducing or drawing down emissions is there. Now, the effect of one, maybe one of the participants knows this and is more of a, of a um, climate or chemist, I don't know, because to compare methane and CO2, every gigaton that we can get rid of is surely a good one, but maybe someone else, I can't answer it, I, I would need to consult, but maybe someone else volunteers to answer this. My gut feeling would be um, that the, the, the amplification factor, uh, as we have seen on the, in the presentation, the F gases are just 2% of the, of the overall emissions, of the greenhouse gas emissions. And yet we saw on the project drawdown that like a big junk was attributed to refrigeration. So it must have a different amplification effect F gases than CO2, but that's just my estimated guess knowing these two slides. But anyway, uh, if any one of you wants to volunteer and give us a more scientific answer, please do. Thank you so much. Um, dear students, um, you can still uh, write your questions into the chat box, but uh, in the, me oh, now there is a comment, the legal, differentiation in targets is interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so it was just a comment. Kigali is not yet kicking in, in Africa, for example, at all. And yet knowing that global warming is taking place, we know more air conditions will, particularly in the emerging economies, and here I'm talking Nigeria, and I'm talking India, and I'm talking, of course, Brazil, and those that were previously referred to as tigers, we will have more and more of these devices applied everywhere. And if the regulations are not put in place to, to, to manage them well in the full cycle, consumption and production cycle, we are running into big problems. Ah, great. Yeah, Methane has a 28 fold greenhouse gas effect compared to CO2. Ha! But usually one counts in CO2 equivalent which is an abstract measure for making the gases comparable. Thank you, Martin. This is brilliant. Thanks for clarifying it. Do you want to add something to it? Then floor is yours. No, not really. You know, like oh. methane is much more, it's, it's much more harmful aggressive. basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much more aggressive. It has like mm -hmm. this 25, something like that. And, and there are even other gases that are even much more accelerating the greenhouse gas um, effect in this case, but yeah. yeah. Do you know that, I mean, now I'm probing you, which is a bit mean, but the nitrous oxide compared to methane, compared to F gases, what's the worst? Like what's the, is there a most evil out of those? I think the, the nitrous oxides are even are even worse than methane. It's like Oof, okay. CO2, methane, and, and I don't know what the, what the F gas is, like what the, the mm -hmm. ratio is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin, brilliant. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question in the meantime, yes, uh, <laughs> while we're waiting. I've just been thinking that, you know, now that we live in this time of um, neo-nationalism and authoritarian regimes and the time of polarization of societies, what in your view, I mean, how difficult in your view is it to reach these goals? that there huh. are, I mean, is it, <laughs> because I always think that these goals, they, they are great and what, one reads them and thinks that, oh, this is amazing. Mm. And of course, every country, every nation should like be part of it because mm. we just have this one planet and we want to keep mm. living in it. But, um, you know, how, how is the sort of, uh, sort of say, like the reality of it? when you implement, I mean, are they willing to implement this project in different countries? What yeah, is your yeah. view on that? 
Thank you so much. And actually, before we turn to that, Iris has commented that the F gas is global warming effect uh, 23,000 times greater than carbon dioxide. So, oof. so there's the extrapolation of the chart of F gas is the 2% and yet having such an effect in the project drawdown calculation makes sense, 23,000 times. That's good to know. Thank you, Iris. Um, the, the national efforts to do it. Well, <laughs> yeah. What, what we are encountering right now is it boils down to people. And indeed, as you said, the neo-nationalist times that, are, that have now happened in the past years really thankfully, hopefully have come to an end, at least in the US, um, to the extreme that it was portrayed with Trump as a, as a my country first kind of attitude. Um, but we still see nationalist movements all across the globe. And unfortunately, and Ban Ki-moon is being very outright about this. He's pointing at leaders and he names them. He says the Bolsonaros of this world, the uh, Erdogans, the Orbans, they are not global citizens. They don't have the mindset of looking out for more than just the advantage of their own nation. And it's understandable that to a certain degree you get reelected by like doing elbow tactics and protecting your people. But of course, if you take the long-term perspective, that's not quite useful. And everyone who has studied economics in, in, this, in this crowd here tonight of the 51 knows that the moment we are just focusing on our small village, like we are talking the, 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 the mercantilist approach of we are independent from the rest of the world, you have to barter, you have to trade with other villages to actually see the growth and to see the, the better ends of your society developing. And it's similar with global topics. We have to work together. COVID was a point in, in a case in point. We only in collaboration we will manage to to get the world to a state where interactions can be relatively normal again. Now, of course, reality hits hard because yes, the Paris Climate Agreement is not um, maybe not ambitiously followed to the degree that was hoped for in 2015. I say that because the metrics of the numbers speak for themselves. The hundred billion that are that are needed don't come through. Even if they come through, sometimes the projects where they are invested in are not found that are scalable. We have countries that, out of sheer immediate economic benefit, are burning their forests. And here I'm talking about Brazil, that allows football fields every day to be burned for. Uh, uh, meat production, but also for soy um, uh, agriculture. Um, and it's, it's a short term benefit, again, that is understandable because of political cycles, but that is, of course, super harmful for the rest of the world. We are pumping chemicals into the ocean. Yet, and this is where my positivism comes in, um, I truly believe that the world has a fever right now, and we know the world has a fever. And Greta and other characters are reminding us very well about that. We are sick as world. And indeed, when you have a fever, the first step is you stay home. You might not yet want to see a doctor. You stay home and you, you try to breathe deeply and relax. And I believe that we are right now at the crucial point of needing to see the doctor. And fortunately, there is entities like the UNFCCC, like the, the, the meetings that happen um, like every year, like the COP in Glasgow now, 26, COP26, like um, we have gatherings across the globe where people come together to drum the drum of what we are talking here tonight. So I want to be positive. I want to say that, yes, the nationally determined contributions, countries, will want to achieve them. I have to believe in this because otherwise it would be, it would be really abysmal. Um, the, uh, the VNRs, so the voluntary national reviews that you need to submit to the UN when you are reporting about your SDGs. Fact is, those VNRs that are handed in, they credit climate action in their countries. So they, they make a mention of it. And yet there is the Bertelsmann Stiftung that has done a ranking of how well countries worldwide are doing in the implementation of the overall SDG. And interestingly enough, the judgment even of European Union countries, and they're like leading, they're in the upper third in this ranking, not even they fulfill climate goal 13. So we are really falling short of the promise. 
So more needs to be done. But then Ria, let me quote you back when you say the micro project can do something. Yes, it might be a drop in the ocean. And yes, it might look volatile if you're starting to do a recycle up project in your school, in your university. But in fact, it's not. It is not. And it makes a difference for each and every one of us, the little things that we can do. I want to believe in it. But yes, you're right. We have a problem, but it means we need to go and vote. We need to vote for the people that are not seeking nationalistic uh, attempts and, and nationalistic viewpoints, are not doing elbow tactics in international politics, but are believing that in collaboration we can achieve more. That was now a super long answer of mm -hmm. positivist vibe and energy who, yeah. Too. But I guess also the question was very broad, so I'm sorry yeah, <laughs> for that. Yeah, and now yeah. in the meantime, I can see that there had, I mean, people have been writing into the chat more questions, but we mm -hmm. are running out of time or we are already over time into the next session. But um, maybe we can use the chat for the next five minutes and just um, um, sure. see uh, what the yeah. conversation or where the conversation goes from there and I will hand over to Martin now. Thank you so much for thank talking you, to Ria, us Thank you, thank you Martin. Thank you Monica for your great talk. Thank you for being here once again. Uh, we proceed now to, to the next lecture we have to the next guest speaker we have today. Um, Jelle de Schreiber, I will quickly introduce him if I see him somewhere around. Let's see. Yes. He's there, that's good. So Jelle de Schreiber is a biologist with a, with a PhD in philosophy who works as assistant professor at Antwerp University. He teaches didactics of philosophy and history. In his research, he focuses on the use of dialogue to elicit reflection about science and society. He facilitates dialogues about science and climate with both school students and teachers he developed learning materials to be used in schools and centers for science education to help students reflect upon the challenges with regard to sustainable development. Thank you very much for being here, Jelle. The stage is yours, and I think it fits very well together with what Monica has just told us when it comes to climate change, um, and climate action education, and about looking what young people are, are concerned with, actually. Buena. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, uh, well, I'll try to give a, a, a short uh, talk about how to use, and this is very concrete, uh, certain kinds of dialogues when you're interacting with students or with teachers or with anybody and you want them to convince or to make them reflect about climate change because maybe climate change is a big challenge. Perhaps it's an even bigger challenge to make um, us all aware and um, ambitious to, uh, to, to take action. Um, that's the goal. Um, where will I start with? Um, do you know uh, philosophy walks? Maybe uh, you have once or twice heard about it or you haven't. A philosophy walk is a kind of walk students make two by two, three by three, and they all have a question. They have a question and the two or three of them, they are trying to look an, for an answer to this question. And by walking, they are reflecting, they are exchanging ideas, and in the end, they come up with an answer and they then they change partners and uh, they uh, retackle the same question again. It's a small technique, it's a method to have students, people reflect. We have them reflect about a lot of issues. And uh, here you see the, the legs of the, the rather young children. Uh, this is a method we use both in primary schools and in secondary schools. We use questions that are difficult or easy or maybe too easy, but still difficult. Questions such as, um, does the art need a doctor? And maybe just <laughs> to have a, a, yeah, a small game, would you like to answer this question? You, you can use the chat uh, room. So what do you think? Does the art need a doctor or not? Or something else? Feel free to answer. It's not a trick question. Yes, caretakers. 
Yep. Scientists are doctors. Yes, caretakers. Okay. I, as we know the art is sick, we need a doctor. As we know the art is sick. And these may be the answers. And I would, uh, if, if we have, we are having dialogue with in a classroom, I would ask, yeah, is the art sick? Can the art be sick? Um, is a caretaker the same as a doctor? Uh, what can a doctor do? These are kinds of responses you can have to respond to these answers. Um, I'll give you some examples of uh, children. When we, these are primary school children. Does the art need a doctor? No, the art is a planet and the planet cannot be sick. Okay. Uh, no, we don't need to cure the art. What we call sick is maybe good for someone else, a being that doesn't exist yet. Someone in the future will or might evolve once the people have gone extinct. Or the other one, uh, yes, we need to cure the earth. And because adults do nothing, uh, children should be the planet's doctors. Might be an answer as well. Or uh, also a relevant one, no, uh, not the earth needs a doctor, people do. People need a doctor to make them care about the earth. So these are the challenges. These are the ideas that might come up when you start dialogues with simple questions such as these. This is the beginning. When you have the dialogue, you can focus on a, a topic, on a problem, on an issue, on, on a definition, and you can explore these ideas by having students, people exchange their views. Um, and actually, I have a, yeah, a different <laughs> philosophical question, or I don't know whether it's a philosophical one, but how do you shape or change people's minds about climate change? Actually, this is what I said in the beginning. It's maybe one of the biggest challenges we have today. How do you make people think something or how do you make people think something else? Um, and I guess we all have some ideas about it. And, and some of us think when we go walking and we have a big walk from north to south, then by doing so, uh, we can change people's minds or we can uh, change people's minds by yeah, telling them what's the matter. We can change people's minds by um, making them afraid. And there are many different approaches um, and the one will, be, uh, will work better than the other. Um, and on the other hand, um, yeah, it, it will always depend on the kind of public we have in front of us. Are they informed? Are they polarized? Are they against the teacher in front of them? Or, or are they rather accepting what he's saying? So these all influences how we might answer the question. I will focus on three elements. Um, and, and I'll do so by, by taking or keeping in mind uh, this idea of uh, Kirin Sataya, where she says that, um, yeah, if you want to pay, change people's minds, you have to make them think. That's also that's some kind of... Uh, strong idea she's proposing but if you want to make them think you have to make their thinking visible and for instance if you have them to, if you want them to think about ethics in a way about values well you have to make their their ethical values explicit and how do you make their ethical values explicit well the point of my talk will be that you can use these philosophical dialogues as instruments to um, uncover all these hidden assumptions and thereby start a dialogue. So by making a thinking visible. Um, I point out uh, three different domains and I'll focus on these uh, three domains in the talk. So first, um, yeah, how do you make, uh, or how do you shape people's minds? Um, yeah, you have to have them understand what's the matter and the talk we heard previously uh, really helps me understand what's the matter. So it's a relevant and a, an essential intervention to do when you're interacting with young children or children or students. The second thing is, um, you, in a way you have, them, uh, you have to make students identify with the message you're bringing. And it's a different thing from understanding what uh, you are telling them. Um, they have to agree that it's relevant or that it's worthwhile doing so. Why should I care about future generations? It's yeah, 
first it, it may be a very simple or easy answer but actually it, it's not but uh, why should we invest so much money in something which will be a good thing for people who are not living right now this might be a question a student can answer or can ask so it's a matter about values what do we think is important and the third thing is um yeah um it's good to understand um, what's the matter in, in climate change. It's good to know it's important, but then the, the last thing is, yeah, what can I do? How, what can I do as a student, as, as a 20 year old, as a 10 year old to make a change, to contribute to this process? And yeah, can I make a difference? So these are actually three aspects and um, that ought to be covered when you're working on yeah, the, the mind of someone who is either a climate change denier or uh, yeah, who is in doubt or who is learning about it. So these three things are things I will uh, focus on in the next uh, few minutes uh, by giving you some examples. Oh. Okay. Um, yes, voila. How will I give you uh, some examples? Well, this is an example of a uh, people engaging in a philosophical dialogue. Uh, I, I gave you the example before of, of, of students or uh, pupils walking. They, uh, most of the time we are sitting in a circle. Uh, one of us is a facilitator. This is the woman in, in yellow. And then the students are either thinking or uh, exploring or yeah, uh, being very puzzled and, and, and still contributing to the dialogue. So uh, what do you need to have a dialogue? Um, you need uh, four steps, actually. First, you have a stimulus, then, have, then you have a question, then you have the dialogue, and in the end, you have a reflection. I'll go into the details, details of it now. So what can be a stimulus? A stimulus is a shared experience that uh, challenges your thoughts or what you expect. It can either be um, a funny image, it can be an art, a work of art, it can be a film, it can be an experience, it, it can be something you see, it can be something, yeah, which opens our minds. So if you want to engage in philosophical dialogue, look for a shared experience. First step, the stimulus. Second step, um, look for a philosophical question. Either you introduce the philosophical question yourself as a facilitator, or you look for the questions that are living among the students and the pupils. They all have their questions in mind, and if you give them the right kind of stimulus, they will, yeah, these questions will pop up. Yeah. Is it bad that polar bears go extinct? Yeah, uh, I don't know, not necessarily. So this might be a question. Or um, do we need to care of or do we need to care about future generations might be another question. What is a philosophical question? Yeah, if I would explain it to students or primary school children, I would say it's a question that even Google doesn't know the answer to. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a philo philosophical question in itself to explain what a philosophical question is, but still. It's a question that is not easy to answer, or you will, even if, in the end, you will not have a final answer. That's also a way to um, define what the philosophical question is. Or you can say it's a, a question that tunes into uh, themes such as humanity, reality, values. These are all kinds of philosophical questions. So first you have the stimulus, then you have the question. The third thing is you have the dialogue. And what is this philosophical dialogue? Um, yeah, actually there's this facilitator and he only uh, asks questions. That's the thing, he takes what is known as the Socratic stance. He's not saying or telling what he thinks himself while he or she is facilitating the dialogue. At that moment, he's only helping students to uh, phrase what they already think or know or um, whether they agree with something they heard, um, whether they can give an example. So the facil facilitator, um, he asks questions that elicit thinking. This is the hardest part. Um, for most of us, and also uh, for, for us, because uh, also in the case of climate change, because we are convinced what is a good thing to do, 
it's for us it's important to tackle climate change well therefore it will be hard for us to have this dialogue because it may be that some students might say something with, with, uh, where we don't agree with what they are saying so it's it's harder and we are in yeah we are inclined to intervene but if we do the dialogue ends that's the thing if you start to give um, answers as a facilitator yourself then the group isn't thinking anymore you are thinking and um, the students or participants are, are are seeing it looking at you and they know yeah you are you, you studied for it you know something so tell us the answer and then the dialogue ends so um, the dialogue um, is made by uh, the facil facilitator when he only asks these questions. And finally, there is the reflection phase. Um, it's the phase where uh, we can wrap up, where we can reflect literally on what we said before. On um, And this is a, an, an interesting question as well. So how can you translate your thoughts or the thoughts you developed during the dialogue into action? So it's uh, uh, coming down from your mind, your thoughts to reality and what you can do or what you learned and discovered or which questions remain un unanswered, which questions would you like to answer later? Um, for now, these are the, the four steps in a philosophical dialogue. So I, I showed you the, these things. So now you know more or less it is it's a pity we uh, yeah i won't be able to uh, facilitate the dialogue with you it might be interesting still maybe if you have a question it will work but we'll see um this is the reflection and then um let's go back to the beginning uh, how um yeah what do we how do we shape people's minds well if you work with the philosophical dialogue you're actually focusing on yeah, many different kinds of thinking, but three kinds of thinking which are relevant in the context of um, change or broader in the context of education for sustainable development. On the one hand, you have system thinking. Um, perhaps you're familiar familiar with this. This is uh, the concept where you have yeah, where you're exploring many different concepts that are um, connected to a certain problem and how they are interacting. So that's the interaction between uh, the molecule, the air, the plants, and so so on. You're uh, helping um, student, students think about values, about what's important, to uh, uncover the values they think are important, and to help them to, to uh, balance these values. Because very often, the values we ha have are, in a way, contradictory. And in the end, um, you can also uh, use these dialogues to help students think about actions, about what you can do or what, what you can't do or how you can make yourself do something. These are three different kinds of thinking that can be stimulating by, stimulated by using these dialogues. Let me give some, some more examples. Um, voila. Can a burning piece of wood become a tree again? It's a hard question or a simple question, maybe both. Um, well, if you have students answer the, this question, they will say, yeah, it depends on already. Of, of course, it depends on what they know already. But they will use the words and the concepts they have in mind to explore this thing or this difficulty. And um, the key idea which may come up or will come up very often is, yeah, um, wood can be CO2 and the CO2 can be used by the trees to make new wood. So yeah, in the end, um, the, the wood can become a new tree, but yeah, on the other hand, yeah, it's different wood. It's not the same wood. So after all, it's still different. So there's a certain philosophical tension. And um, the thing is, um, we are not really in, interested in the, the key or the uh, central answer to this question. What we use or what we aim for is uh, using this, this question to help students reflect and to look, in this case, at the different uh, themes, topics that are related to um, wood, fire, 
CO2 um, uh, circle of life and these kinds of concepts. So in the final answer, it's not really the most important thing you aim for as a facilitator, because yeah, this, these questions cannot be answered or, or given, given a, a final answer, but by trying to give the answer, actually as a student or a participant, you're doing some really relevant and interesting things. This is one example. This is a second one. Make you be bad. Maybe um, can you help me again by perhaps <laughs> giving some answers? Um, tell me, can a molecule be bad? You can either say yes or no or something else, and then yes because or no because. I'm curious. What do you think? Can a mole molecule be bad? No, the molecule has no intentions. Yes, if it's in the wrong place at the wrong time. No, a molecule is not thinking and acting. Um, yes, but it depends. Okay. It doesn't harm on purpose. It's interesting. So we have different ideas. It's relevant. We have people who say either yes or no. We can value the consequences as negative or positive. Um, what I would do as a facilitator is, yeah, we have a yes and a no. I would choose two students, for instance, uh, the one, said, one of them says yes and the other says no and then ask them do you disagree with what the other said um, yes I disagree or no I disagree why do you disagree well I disagree because according to me a molecule can be bad really yes bad means voila, and then it's interesting bad means that it's not good for us do we all agree is bad the same as um, it's not good for us no, someone else might answer. Yeah, not good for us. It, bad is, is broader than this. We, we don't only have to think about humans. We, only, we also have to think about the planet. So bad means it's um, bad for all of us. And all of us means all the humans, all, all the animals. Someone else might answer. Yeah, it's not possible. Some things are good for all of us and they are or some some things are good for some of us and not for all of us okay um let's go back to co2 is it good for all of us is it bad for all of us is it good for all of us one may answer depending on what they already know um yeah actually it's good for trees the more co2 there is the better they will grow because they use CO2 to grow. Uh, yes, that's okay. But if there's too much CO2, they won't be able to grow anymore because the climate and temperature will, will go too high. For now, this is a, 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 a dialogue I, I just imagined based on some of your uh, proposals, but it's a realistic dialogue to have. And which kind of dialogue do you have? Um, actually, you're speaking about what is good and what is bad, you're discovering that good and bad depend on the perspective you take, that it's not always easy to have one global perspective to answer what is good or what is bad, that it depends, but still we have to make a common choice and then we can phrase some kind of definition or ID and we can still discuss this and then in the end we might agree, we bad means for now, some very simple ID. And um, when you have students participate in these kinds of dialogues, in the end, they will phrase the IDs, which are very often the base for um, these uh, uh, Paris agreements, for instance, where we speak about justice. And um, yeah, but what is justice? It's, it's a difficult word as well. And, and the former speaker, she was speaking about this as well. Yeah, 
if you were responsible for much of uh, the CO2 output in the past, but you're not, um, you're not contributing to it as much today, yeah, um, should you uh, reduce your CO2 sp uh, spending even more? So it can be difficult to know what just is, but speaking about justice is very relevant because it makes you aware about what it means. And by exploring these discussions, yeah, more and more you're motivated and, and, and informed about the topic at hand. That's the goal. And that's, uh, that's uh, the reason why having these dialogues may be relevant. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious for your answers, but still, well, you, you should uh, play with these questions later. Um, Voilà. Uh, yeah, a relevant question as well. But can children change the world? It's a matter of yeah. It's a matter of re reflection about your own actions. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, of course I can't ch change the world. What I because I have to do what my parents tell me to do. Is it really? Can't you make a difference? Is there a way we can make a difference? If all the children at the same time would say we won't do this anymore. Do we make a difference? So it's a way um, to think about what you can do. It's a way to think about your own actions. It's a way to explore these actions from different perspectives. What I'm sharing with you here are only, so I, I, I was speaking about the stimulus, the question, the, the dialogue. Well, I'm only sharing the questions because they show you what the, the topics can be. Um, a different way yeah, to approach this matter, or a different stimulus might be, for instance, um, a small case or a case study. If you are an activist and, and you are considering to take actions against climate change, and you know that what you are in, uh, thinking of will be effective in changing people's minds, yeah, um, which actions would you consider? And um, do you think, eh, it would be a good thing to think of uh, to do these things okay if you have this dialogue with the group of children then they will have many relevant ideas but the next step is um would the same actions be allowed to campaign against um uh, lgbt themed books in primary schools so i make a conflict there on the one hand you can think of many actions which are relevant for a purpose you agree with. For instance, um, we want to fight climate change. But the other, on the other hand, yeah, are these actions also, or can I be undemocratic in a way? Or, or am I allowed to, to say very, to, to uh, change or to, to yeah, not fight or uh, do anything? Yeah, for any goal, does the un end justify the means? Um, or is there something particular about climate change that uh, give, allows me <laughs> to be more disruptive than in other cases? And why would this be or why wouldn't this be? So um, to wrap up, uh, I'm giving you an example that would also help students, these are uh, older students, think about what they can do and whether uh, what they can do it's a good thing to do or whether it isn't. And what makes something an action good or bad? Voilà. These are goals to have them reflect. Um, voilà. uh, I don't know about the timing. I still have, yeah, yeah it's half an hour. So um, what are the challenges when you're facilitating dialogue? Well, um, yeah, uh, the difficult thing is what I said before, how you can you take the Socratic stance? How can you facilitate without uh, giving answers? This is yeah, a matter of training. Um, the difficult thing is, how do you respond to an unwelcome answers that go against what you think? Um, I would answer this question by saying, um, while the dialogue is uh, continuing, I wouldn't really give my view or my answer, but I would look for as many different answers in the group and then in the end, students themselves will react to uh, something I would have reacted to towards. Um, and then, yeah, what if this dialogue is frustrating or 
whether it leads to frustration and it, it might. So each question elicited another one. And in the end, I didn't know what to think anymore. I was really sad and I got a headache. So I take some medication, but actually I liked it very much. Yes, this might be an answer. This is an answer of a student. Um, the thing is, is this necessarily a bad thing? Actually, what Jana is saying here, she has been thinking, she has been uh, discovering it's much more complex than she knew or thought, but in the end, yeah, she likes it and she wants to continue because this is uh, what happens very often. If you end the dialogue or the discussion, they will come back with new questions later on. They will ask these questions to their parents, to their teachers, to each other, and this is what's the motivating thing. They uh, start sharing the problem. And because they are frustrated, they want to find the answers. So um, this is the thing that, that works and which is interesting. And then, um, yeah, what is uh, uh, something else? I will skip this one. I will skip this one, but I will end with this one. Thus far, I've been giving examples of dialogues and questions about climate change, about climate, about sustainability, about the values. But in the end, actually, it also depends on what we understand that science is. If a student um, doesn't grasp the meaning of science or how science gives you new knowledge or how science makes, yeah, uh, small steps, uh, 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 the progress in science goes in, in small steps. Well, yeah, he can be frustrated as well because the scientists said they, there would be an increase in temperature in two degrees in, in 10 years and 10 years later there isn't. So the scientist is wrong. Why should I take into account whatever the scientist said if he can make his own mistakes? Well, of course, uh, we have to understand how uh, science in itself works to be able to uh, address um, these difficult questions. So um, and, uh, focusing on, and on questions about science themselves and, and teaching about science is in itself a relevant issue to do. And if we do so, um, in the end, we might motivate um, students to further participate and uh, walk along any path towards uh, climate justice. For now. This is the, the story. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, ask them uh, in the chat or mail me. I'll, I'll be happy to discuss and ex explore this, this further. Thank you very much, Gele. Thank you for taking us on this philosophical dialogue journey and also for posing a lot of questions without giving answers. That's, that's, very, that's very fruitful. Um, I will just look at the chat and look at if there are already some questions popping up. Because we have a little bit a little bit less than 10 minutes now until the break. Oh, there is one by Joachim. I will just read it out loud. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. I was a bit surprised that many of the questions seem lead to yes, no answers. In my experience, this tends to inhibit an open dialogue because the others seem to assume that there is one correct answer but perhaps a different age group or different stimuli beforehand changed this logic. Could you give your opinion on this? What do you think? Um, they seem closed questions because they are yes or no, but actually these are open questions. Um, they are uh, conceptually open. The first thing is you answer yes or no. I, can I give an example? Um, uh, but, um, yeah. Yeah, is an apple alive? It's not a, a climate connected question, but still is an apple alive? It's a closed question. It's a philosophical question because you're talking about life and it, uh, in, you have to answer either yes or no, but that's okay because as soon as you answer yes, I ask you uh, for what reason? What's the reason you answer yes? And I'm not, looking, I'm not interested in the yes or no. I'm interested in the reason you give the easy thing when you're working with yes and no questions is um, that students are happy to participate. They are, uh, who thinks yes, and they raise their hand, who thinks no, and they do. And then they are 
actually engaged in dialogue already, rather than if I ask you the question, what is life or what is justice? It's a big question, it's a bit frightening, and then I will be less inclined to um, participate. So this is what we observe in, in context of using these philosophical dialogues. So I agree, Joachim, um, that it, it might be, yeah, uh, inclined to stop dialogue, but actually it isn't. If you ask for these arguments and reasons. Okay, thank you. There is another question coming in from Johanna, but isn't it hard for children to have aims and to change something without getting a kind of effectiveness check of their behavior, something near they can see as success? Do you know what Johanna means? Or maybe Johanna can specify it a little bit more. So. I think Jelle is, is did we lose Jelle? I think we lost him, yes. Because his presentation is still here on and I can only see the one who is speaking here on the side. Yes, he just said his video stopped. Oh, okay, Cannot hear no, us. it's in the chat. Uh, can you speak, Jelle, and maybe we can hear you even though your video doesn't work? I think he's completely gone now. Yes, he is. Um, okay, maybe we wait like one or two minutes and see if he manages to join us. Oh, he can answer in the chat. That's good. Okay. So... Um, thank you very much again then for your talk, Jelle. Maybe you can answer in the chat uh, to, to Johanna's question. And if we don't get you back quasi physically, then uh, again, thank you very much. And I will just leave open the chat then some more minutes before we get into the break so that there can be some conversation there. And yes, thank you again, Jelle. And we will have a break from 18.15 on, so in three minutes, then for 50 minutes, and also we will reconvene at, at half past six, in this case, at 18.30. And until then, please feel free to chat with each other uh, in the chat and to post some more questions. Oh, there is also- And we'll try if there is anything that we can do to put him back. I see, I see that he's also in there. Okay, we seem, we seem to have completely lost him. <laughs> We're sorry, but yeah. Let's see, at least he's, he's still in the chat. So um, yeah. But I think there could be some button maybe that we could press to unmute him because I just saw that he's like, um, maybe he has the same rights as the students now at the moment for some reason. It yeah, has he switched. has been in like with the second account and I've just made him a co-host so he should be able to do that actually. So. Let's see. Yeah, but we can see that there is a lively um, discussion going on in the chat, which is great. So even though we don't hear Jelle, um, he is still with us there in the chat. And should we read it out loud or I think you all can read in the chat.
Okay. I myself will go into the break now, um, but you can just stay in there if there are any more discussions going on in the chat. See you in a bit. Bye. Okay, see you at, when is the break ending? It's 10 to 15 minutes. Bye. Hello everyone and welcome back uh, from the break. We really apologize for these technical inconveniences at uh, the end of our last session. I think we could have had a wonderful discussion still, but um, sometimes these things happen and there is nothing that we can do. Uh, but Jelle sends um, his regards as well. He just wrote us an email. His, um, it just lost the connection to us um, and yes but now we are here in the new session and um, I thought uh, together with Martin that maybe we'll try something new <laughs> that because some of you have excellent questions but they do come a little bit um, later and then we are running out of time and then there is no uh, possibility to answer these questions anymore so Let's try now that you can like during the lecture, if you have something on your mind, you can already put it in the chat box. And then once the lecture is done, we will read it out loud and let's see if we um, manage that way better. So um, having said that, we will now continue with our third lecture of this evening. Um, this time from the perspective of a national park ranger from the national park. And I'm very excited to introduce you now to our third guest of the day, Valeria Ledochowski. And um, she is, yes, she is here with us. No technical problems there. Welcome. So Valeria, she has studied landscape architecture and landscape planning at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, with a spe special focus on riverine landscapes. After her studies, she has worked for some time in a mobility planning office and since 2016, she's working as a national park ranger in the Donauaun National Park, responsible for visitor support and part of diverse nature conserva conservation projects. National Park, she's guiding national park visitors of every age and background, making the mediation and conveying of nature conservation both challenging and exciting. So with that introduction, the next 30 minutes are yours and please go ahead. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to start to um, share my screen. I hope this is working. Okay. Um, Yes, so when I first um, heard of, of um, your project and the climate walk, I was actually very excited because I'm also a very passionate long distance hiker. And um, the climate change topic is uh, um, a highly personal and professional uh, interest of, of mine. So I'm very glad that I can be part um, today and tell you something of my um, experiences to the current topics. Um, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I had a very nice chat um, with Nathan from the WWF, which you are going to meet in the next session. And we um, were talking about um, the journey to change, the starting the journey to climate action. And um, this journey starts with um, creating awareness to the importance of our nature and to get um, a connection to it. So that is actually the first step to get active. And that's um, what I'm going to 
uh, talk about today. And um, also according to the last um, session from Jella, um, he called this, uh, I think this um, starting the journey um, is how, to, how you can shape the, the people's minds to uh, climate change through the importance of, of an intact and healthy nature. So this is actually what we park rangers in the national parks are doing is the stimulation um, to the thinking about values. Um, but first of all, I want to introduce you to the um, world of the national parks we do have here in Austria, um, because I think we are having a very diverse um, audience here today, and you might not all be um, familiar to the national parks we do have here in Austria. So um, altogether, there are six of them, and I just want to um, shortly um, introduce you to each and every one of them, um, so you get um, a nice um, impression of the rich um, diversity of different uh, landscapes we do have here um, that get protected. So here in the middle of um, Austria, we do have the Gesäuse, which is um, 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 a canyon-like national park that is very rocky, has mountains, and um, is um, covered with woods, and um, also well known for the Austria's um, best hotspots of endemic plants and animals. And it's also um, very popular for climbing. Then we do have um, the National Park Hohe Tauern, which is the oldest and biggest national park of um, Austria and it um, lies um, in the Alps. So um, it is full of um, mountains and glaciers. And in the center of this national park, we do um, also have the highest mountain of Austria, the Großglockner. And um, although mountains seems like to be a very um, not so spectacular um, uh, landscape, or it seems like a, a, a very uh, sad kind of landscape, it do, does have a, very um, rich um, diversity um, and very rich diverse ecosystems. And it's also well known for um, the project of reintroducing the birded vulture. It's the bird that you can see here on this picture. Then in the heart of Austria, um, we do have the Kalkalpen National Park, which is famous for being the largest forest area we do have here in Austria. And it also um, is famous for remaining the last links. That's the big cat you can see here on the picture as well. And this national park is also full with um, forest, old forest, streams, sources, caves, and gorge, and it's very beautiful. Then on the very east side, we do have um, the National Park Neusiedlersee and Seewinkel, um, which is famous for being the only step national park in, in Austria. And um, also one part of this national park um, is crossing the border to Hungary. And so this is um, uh, the big lake that is surrounded by uh, reeds and it's a very important habitat for um, as thousands of um, migratory birds. And it also has extreme habitats that can be found um, in the salty, regularly dehydrating soda pools. Then on the north um, part of Austria, we do have the smallest national park, um, which uh, is also crossing the border to uh, Czech Republic. And this is um, one of um, this national park protects one of the finest and most biodiverse valley landscapes in uh, Europe. And it's also a um, part of the um, of the green belt, um, which is a uh, very healthy nature that is actually a consequence from the Iron Curtain. And it, um, um, it provides a habitat for animals like the European wildcat, uh, which seem to have been disappeared from Austria um, a very long time ago, but here it still has a natural habitat where it can live. And then last but not least, um, we do have the uh, Donauer National Park, that's a national park where I'm working. And it's um, also very famous because it's the last uh, great floodplain landscape that is left in uh, Europe. And it connects the capitals Vienna and Bratislava. And this is actually um, one of the last parts where the Danube can still um, flow freely, um, which means that there are no hydroelectric power plants um, stopping the, the river from flowing. So the Danube is still able to create um, with its regular floods a very creative and dynamic landscape. 
um, that gives um, many endangered animals and plant species um, then an area, an area where they are possible, where they have possibilities to survive. So then we are going to the task and aims of a national park. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details um, with this slide. You can just um, read it through by, by yourself. It just explains um, what the task and aims of a national park are. Also, together you can just say, okay, a national park is a landscape that has a very um, important kind of nature and gives the habitants to very um, to a lot of endangered animal and plant species, and that needs um, protection. And um, also, one one task or one aim of a national park um, should be to serve um, the national park should, should serve um, for environmental education. And this is actually what we are going to talk um, about now. So let's start the journey. Um, so what, what are we park rangers uh, doing in the national park? The job, the main job of a park ranger is to um, guide the visitors through the national park to show them the secrets and the um, magic of the nature and the importance of the nature we do have here. So um, this is where you are, um, start to create awareness to the people, um, to, give, um, to give them a good time. Um, they are spending a good time here in the national park and that they can finally connect to the nature and understand why it is so important to protect it. And um, the rangers is actually um, facing um, some challenges because um, we do have a lot of different um, visitors coming to the national park. So the challenge is how do we reach each and every one of them? Because they all have um, different needs, they all have different expectations, and they all need to be treated in a different kind of way um, to, to finally reach them the best. So I just picked out the main uh, common groups of kind of visitors um, we do welcome in our national park and I just want to introduce, um, introduce you to them and just to um, explain you how, how to reach them the best. So first of all, we do have kids, a lot of them. Um, kids come with school classes, with families, whatsoever. Um, here I want to introduce you the, um, the youngest kids. It's like kindergarten kids and elementary school kids and they like to explore. They like the adventure, they like physical activity, and um, they want to play in the water, they want to enjoy the freedom, they want to discover and explore, and they are also enjoying being outdoors, because outdoors, for most of the times, they are allowed to do more stuff than usually at home. Um, so it is um, very important um, if you just give the kids um, working outdoors where you can um, you can let the kids do stuff by themselves, like collecting shells or collecting rocks or whatever, and to really let them explore everything by themselves. And kids are totally interested into animals. Everything is just about animals. It's the most interesting for them. And uh, especially, which is very interesting, they're super interested into bugs. Um, this is very, very funny when I'm on a field excursion with them and I, I see a deer um, hiding behind um, a tree. I'm showing them the deer and they are just like, oh, look, there's a ladybird crawling on my jacket. And suddenly this beetle is much more interesting than the big animal hiding behind the trees in front of them. And it's all about the bugs, which is also a big advantage because you can really um, impress the kids um, with very simple things. You can just show them how ants are crawling on the tree and do stuff and whatsoever. And, um, and they are super excited um, to it. Um, so you, you reach the kids in a very good way. You create a very um, dynamic and in, um, program with, for example, also interactive games um, where you can teach them also stuff about nature. Um, let me introduce you one game that I almost always play with, with um, kids in this age. 
It's a very nice um, catching game um, where you are going to explain at the same time how bats are hunting. Um, in this game, the kids are making a circle and there's a, in the middle of the circle is um, one of them volunteering and, and this kid um, gets his eyes covered and it, it's not able to see anymore. So this kit in the middle of the circle is representing the bed. And the surrounding kits, there's one of them, um, or maybe also two of them, are making clicking noises, like And they are representing a moth or a beetle. So the bed um, now has to find the, the moth by just listening to the sound of, of, of it, and it has to catch it. So this is a very um, funny game for the kids. They're enjoying it a lot. And you're accidentally explained them the eco-location that certain animals are using for hunting at night. Um, the next group is families, kind of visitors. Um, in my opinion, this is one of the most um, challenging groups of visitors because they can be super diverse. Um, families to have um, very different kind of backgrounds and connections to the nature. They do have very different needs and expectations. It depends um, um, on the age of the children. It depends on the numbers of adults they are joining them. And um, so it's really tricky to prepare for a field trip with a family because you don't know them and you don't know the interests before and um, you have to be very sensitive. So best of all is if you just um, in the beginning of the of the field trip of the excursion, you're just going to ask the family what their expectations are, and then you can um, give them two or three opportunities, and they can choose. So you have to stay very flexible and um, and be very adaptable to their um, needs. Then there are senior citizens. Um, they are very interested into the nature and culture of the region. Um, they uh, have also a, a high curiosity and they love to exchange their own experience um, they meet with nature or in nature. They also um, like to enjoy the experience in the group. Most of the time the senior citizens are coming or um, visiting the national park in the group. They also like to get entertained and um, most important is for them that they are just having um, a good stay in the national park where they just can enjoy the pleasurement of the fine day outdoors in nature. So that's actually um, a very good way where you can also get, get them. Then we are coming to the teenagers. The teenagers, um, they, want, they want to have action. They want to do sports, they want to get active, they want adventure, um, they want to feel the freedom they can enjoy outdoors. Um, they are probably here with a school class, so they are enjoying it not to sit in a classroom all day long, um, so they can finally be outdoors and do something. Um, it's very important that you stay absolutely authentic when you are working with teenagers, because um, they're going to challenge you and they're going to try to provo provocate you. So it's very important to just be as much yourself as you can be and also to be very open for the ideas um, that are coming from the group. And it's also, um, it's also good if you just be part of the group and that you don't um, take the role of a teacher because what you don't want you, want, you want the kids to have a very positive association to nature. And you don't want them to um, get the feeling to be back in a classroom again, where they just get this um, very dry and controlled way of learning. So um, you, you want them to accidentally learn by just having a great time here in the national park and outdoor at um, nature. So the best thing is actually, if you let do the um, really um, lay hands on natural conservation work, um, give them a shovel and they can dig a hole to, um, to dig in a, a tree um, and plant a new tree or, or just doing something active. 
Then there's another group that is um, the companies. There are actually two different kinds of groups of companies that are having a day out at the national park. So there are most of, of the time it's the bigger companies that um, want to um, do something for, for the image of the company. So they are asking of um, doing some conservational um, work like uh, collecting uh, trash from the, from the river um, and from the wetlands so that they can also communicate, um, look, we are, we are spending our day out of office in a national park and we are doing something um, useful. And, and they are, most of the time they are quite interested also in nature and um, they are also interested into um, um, improving the, the team building of the employees. And then there's another part of, of companies that are coming to visit us. That's more those kind of people who are um, kind of in a party mood. Um, they, they are not working. They have a kind of day off and they are more interested into the social context with their colleagues, into gossiping, into um, having a drink with them. And um, so they they, they didn't choose a destination for this day out of um, with the company um, by themselves. So most of the time, they not re they're not really interested into into nature. Um, but still, you can you can reach them. Um, so here, for example, you just keep the the educational part very short. Um, you're taking more part as an entertainer making jokes with them. So they are also having a very good time in the national park and they enjoyed it. And um, maybe, and that's also what most of the time is happening afterwards, they are going to say, oh, wow, I didn't know that there's a national park in Vienna and um, actually it's really good and I will come back here with my family again. And that's the best that can happen. And then last but not least, we do have um, the group of, um, Experts. So these are, for example, um, a group from from universities or just people that are um, hobby ornithologists um, or um, have very big interest into botanic. And what they want is information, information, information. They are asking for very detailed information that you might not be able to give them because they probably will already know a lot more about nature than you do. Um, so um, the best way to treat these kind of people is um, to ask them if they want to share their own knowledge with the group. And they love to, to do this. They love to talk about their knowledge. And maybe you can also connect um, with their expertises and with their um, areas of, of, of research they're doing. And, you also have the advantage that you, you know the area of the national park very well as a ranger. So you can um, show them um, hotspots um, for observing birds or where you can find certain orchids or whatsoever. So, um, so you can see that um, this was just like, I just picked out the main or common groups we are, we are welcoming in the national park, but you can see that this is um, can be very challenging to reach each and every one of them. And, um, and so what, how, how are you doing it? How, how are you really um, starting the journey? Um, first of all, um, um, you can create a diverse offer. So here in the, in the Donau National Park, we are um, offering um, a uh, lot of different kinds of, of field trips um, the visitors can choose. We can uh, do boat trips on the mainstream of the Danube, which is very exciting, more for the adventurers. Um, but for those who like it a little bit more calmer, um, they can also do a silent um, canyon trip of one of the side arms of the Danube. Uh, we do also offer um, camps in the national park for school classes, but also in the holidays where the kids can spend the whole week and sleep um, overnight there in tents. We do also um, offer working camps where volunteers um, also from 
uh, international volunteers are coming uh, to the national park to spend here a week to um, to work in conservation uh, works in the national park and we also have all kinds of individual programs it's for example um, the conservation work which is um, a perfect way to to get in touch with the consequences for example of um, globalization where, where the people can really literally, literally get in touch with with the knowledge so um, when they are fighting here in the picture you can see um, people fighting the invasive neophytes that um, were brought here so these are foreign plants that were brought here from um, globalization and they were getting rid of those invasive invasive neophytes and they were replanting native um, trees instead so that's when they really get in touch with with the main topics and um, we also do offer field excursion with uh, special topics for example uh, where you can look for the white-tailed eagle um, that um, did come back to the wetlands since the wetlands um, got protected 25 years ago and um, got to be a national park before um, there were too much disturbance so um, the eagles uh, would not come here and breed again but now they are back we also offer um, things for for those who want to explore and discover more and do some water samples they can use the laboratories and whatsoever and um, we also offer um, for those people who do not like to have a guided um, excursion so so they for those people who prefer to explore um, the nature by themselves um, we do offer indoor and outdoor exhibitions um, where we um, just representing um, the ecosystem of the wetlands and um, these are guided by interactive um, informations uh, where people can be by themselves and explore it by themselves but um, also can uh, learn something about nature and here this is um, actually from the national park resource and this is something very extraordinary which i would like to introduce you because this is um, very good to the climate change topic and um, here they, they were, were creating an, an ecological footprint. So this is a very huge maze um, with the shape of a footprint. And when you are entering this maze, you um, find borders um, where there are, there are questions um, about the uh, ecological footprint. And if you answer um, it wrong, um, it will send you um, to a dead end and if you find the right answer the correct answer to this question it will lead you um, further on um, to the next question so altogether there are i think approximately 15 questions um, to the ecological footprint and i've done this um, uh, already by myself and it's really well done so it's it's in my opinion it's very interesting for all kind of ages and it's also very good because it's um accessible and 24 seven it's for free you can go there whenever you want um so last but not least i want to introduce you to a project we do have here in the donor on national park that's um, the so-called junior ranger where i'm also um being part of this project so there we are offering um the kids of the local population from the national park um, the opportunity to be part as a junior ranger. So these kids are from the age from 10 to 20, 25. And um, they are spending um, every summer um, the whole week in the camp with us. And also some single days um, reg on regularly times um, during the year where we are going to meet and work on um, projects. Um, yeah, and the goal behind this is to inspire the kids and because we do have still have some uh, conflicts between the uh, local population and the rules of the national park um, we hope that uh, when we are inspiring the kids that they are coming home and tell them the parents and the grandparents and the aunts and uncles about the um, importance um, 
of the work of the national park. And um, so we hope that we gain more ex acceptance um, to the local population with this. So um, the kids here also um, learn and explore and they come here for several years already. So they really do have a very good knowledge about the nature here in, in the wetlands. And um, they are also um, um, being part of, of, uh, of activities like building um, breeding boxes for endangered um, animals or also getting rid of the neophytes and replanting um, trees. Um, get creative and collecting new experiences. I think these pictures are talking by themselves. Um, so you can see that those kids, they are always having a very great time. And fun is also very important. And um, so you're creating a lot of emotions. Um, last year, we started um, to, to put um, a special focus on the climate change topic. And this was very interesting because we had a day that was just all about climate change. Um, so we started really with the um, kind of way we feed the, um, the children. So we um, made them aware that they were just getting um, ecological, seasonal and regional food. Um, we had a vegetarian day, so we were um, um, already focusing on the topic of the importance of the of the way we feed ourselves in our society. And um, then we were also talking about um, with interactive games, um, they needed to, for example, figure out who are going to be the winners and the losers of the climate change. So which animals are um, actually um, profiting from, from the climate change and which animals or plants um, are suffering below the climate change and um, what it, it is going to do, how it is going to change the wetlands in the future, according to them. And it was very interesting because they already knew a lot about the nature there. And it was also very interesting because they were really touched by this topic. They got very, very emotional and um, and they were like, wow, um, we didn't know how much climate change is is affecting our future, our planet. And please tell me more about it and tell me what can I do? And what can I do to save more energy? What can I do um, to, to, to um, um, eat less meat? And how can I get my parents uh, to sell their car and whatsoever? So they are asking with questions. And um, I also figured out that it is very important um, how you are, um, behaving to these topics and what you as a ranger um, are doing to um, uh, uh, reduce the, the CO2 consumption and everything. So it's very important um, of what you are because the kids are really learning from, from that perspective. And to sum up all together, we are starting a journey. So if you want to, to create awareness of the beauty and importance of our nature, let the people be part of it. Um, if you want them to show the magic of a healthy ecosystem, um, by letting, be part of, um, let, it, let them be part with all the senses, make them, make them um, to go barefoot through the wetlands. They experience the wet sand below the feet. They're getting massaged from the gravel and they feel the cold water refreshing their feet on the hot summer day. Um, they, can, they can taste the sweet taste of berries and herbs that are growing all around us and that nature is offering us. Um, let, them, let them smell the flowers, let them listen to the birds. It will create so much emotions with them. They will. Um, they will connect or they will associate these positive emotions with the nature. So um, what you can also do to, to um, connect the people is be very passionate about what you want to educate the people, be passionate with what you're doing 
and make the people as interested into nature and, um, and the relating topics as you are. That is actually the best way um, you can teach um, the people, but just being what you are. And if you have managed to offer the people a very good day and they could really enjoy it all the time, you will create a very positive and a very strong um, emotions and that they will connect with the nature, with the experience they just had outdoors in the nature. And if they have this very positive association with nature, it makes them want to protect it. And for some of them, that day in the national park was just the beginning of a journey. And hopefully for some of them, this journey will also continue to action. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Valeria, for this introduction uh, and for the invitation to the Austrian National Parks. I felt like being on a, a small journey, <laughs> although not physically uh, been there yet, but uh, it certainly makes me want to do my next weekend trip to the National Park. So, but it was also great to see on how many different levels and with how many different ages and groups of people you're working together with and how you're educating them in different ways because you know all these different ages need obviously different uh, approaches to this big topic of climate change and and it's great how you pick them up there on the grassroots level and it also seemed to work great that people have been posting their questions into the chat. And as we are, as time is running, I would really ask you to give short <laughs> answers. And we will start with the first one, which was uh, from Dikla. And the question was, when you connect with groups, do you also open up discussions on local issues that are controversial? For example, the Lobau tunnel. And if so, how do you manage these discussions? Um, yes. <laughs> um, yes, to give a short answer, I actually almost um, uh, uh, get to this topic to, because we do face a lot of um, uh, conflicts. Um, and um, almost uh, all the time people are asking the, these questions by themselves and you have to be very sensitive um, um, and how, how you are going to tell the people this topic and you really you have to, to go step by step to see okay where, where is their opinion and if, they, if you figure out that they are having an, a different opinion for example they are um, they want to have the Lobau tunnel here and you by yourself are saying better not. Uh, you, ha you have to, to be very sensitive and try to, to keep a very, um, let's say, neutral discussion. This, is, this can be very challenging, but most of the time it's like people just want to get really the um, uh, objective information um, about um, those kind of topics. So you're just going to, mm -hmm. to tell about the pro and contrast of certain certain kinds and what, and, and always try to see both, um, to understand both sides of the conflicts. And yeah. Which connects, by the way, nicely to the philosophical perspective we got before you. So there's always a yes <laughs> and a no, and we need to connect. But now we connect to the next question, which was from Joachim. And he asks, uh, the types of visitors being so different, do you still aim to deliver some key messages to all the different wants uh, regarding the value of the national park? Or do you rely on that they will draw their own conclusions based on their positive experiences? Well, actually, that's um, if you're doing a good job, that um, should be your goal. That to, uh, you have this message um, of the importance of the national park and why this uh, nature needs to be protected. Um, that's actually a message you should send to all kind and all different kind of, of visitors. And this is just, for example, if you have um, uh, companies uh, that are making a day off uh, in the national park and they are not interested at all into nature, 
uh, you just need to to reach that goal in a different kind of way where you just um, try to make them have a, a good association with okay i just had a very nice day here outdoors in nature i i don't know a lot about nature still but um, i have this association okay um that's something I like, um, and I had a good time there, and um, um, it makes me feel positive, and it makes me feel good. That's something I want to protect if it gives me good feelings. So yeah, you this this is actually the challenging part how you how you get this this message this message to all the different groups. Thank you. And then we have one very different question by Johanna, and she asks. Uh, do you have a program to pick up all the farmers who live directly along the Danube National Park? I think it would be very important to get them included in all the awareness topic. For example, three kilometers beside the National Park Danube, people must not drink the water inside their homes because it is completely polluted. Yeah, that's... Um... Yeah, that's that's a, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, actually, we do not have a special program just for the farmers. Um, we do have a regularly um, uh, um, events um, where we try to to uh, create also awareness um, about the work we are doing um, in the national parks, and where we are also inviting um, all the local um, locals there, which also means the farmers and where we try to pick them up and also invite them for discussions. And that's actually the way um, we, can, we can work together with them. But yeah, that's actually a very, very um, a big challenge that uh, the National Park Zona Aun is surrounded by the Machfeld, which is um, uh, the biggest producer of um, agricultural in, in Austria. Yeah, mm. that would be a good point, yeah. Thank you. Then we have Fiorella here who asks, how do you deal with the Corona situation? Do you have some kind of online events because of the circumstances or are you pausing at the moment? If um, you have online events, you're welcome to put them in the chat <laughs> later on. Then the link. <laughs> um, both actually. So um, to be honest, the Corona situation is a quite sad situation also for us. Um, we cannot um, invite or welcome any school classes um, the next month or at least in the next weeks. And um, for the schools, we do have partner schools. Um, we do have um, online solutions just for them. Um, but we adjust, uh, try to adjust our, um, our excursions and our program uh, to the, to the Corona situation. So we are making smaller groups and uh, whatever the current rules are. So yeah, this is quite challenging, especially it was um, last summer, it was very challenging for, for the holiday camps with the kids, but we managed it. <laughs> and the kids enjoyed it still with all the extra rules they were facing. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, thank you. And let's hope it will be better soon <laughs> and that the kids can come in larger groups as well. So thank you very much for this talk. Time is running. You can read all the nice thank you notes in the chat um, before you leave us. And I will now hand over to Martin, who will introduce our next guest. Yes, thank you very much again, Valeria. We're already looking forward to visit you in the National Park and also to hike together and spend some time in nature. Before I want to introduce uh, our next speakers, a group of wonderful speakers, I just want to say that I have just managed to enable uh, that you're allowed to um, switch on your cameras. So please do that in case you want. <laughs> And also in case it doesn't weaken too much your connection. I think we're already a very comparably to the first time we are a quite small group now and I think we can afford to have some kind of more personal interaction it is much more nicer than also for the speakers to not only have you know these black screens all over the, we'd love to see your faces <laughs> exactly <laughs> there we go there we go nice perfect and on that note, um, I will introduce our first program point of our last program of today, a uh, last but not least program point of today's class. We have a wonderful group of inspiring people here from WWF Generation Earth. That is a youth empowerment program 
and a colorful, um, wonderful network of young people who inspire, motivate, educate, and take action for the future of the planet. On that note, there are four people joining us today. If I see that right, that is Nathan Spies, Monika Spiekemann, Leo Moftoglu. I hope it's a shame. I hope I pronounced this name in a right way. And then we also have Bernard Burns Ottinger. I will introduce all of the all of the four very, very briefly. Um, Nathan Spies comes originally from the US, but he has been living in Austria since 2005. He started working for WWF Austria in 2009. Together with seven Austrian youth, they launched WWF's Generation Earth, a youth empowerment program in 2010. You also see in this background that they're celebrating an anniversary. Um, the journey has been an exciting one that is built on forming a strong community of active youth in Austria, but has, has expanded across Europe and the globe and is based on the principle of youth empowerment, that is putting young people in control of their learning actions and paths forward. So that is Nathan, please. Please welcome him. Then we have Monika Spiekemann. She is a geography and intercultural communication student and active in social and environmental youth work. She's part of the Generation Earth Steering Committee, where her focus lies on community building um, within the ne network. Welcome her also, too. Thank you for being here today. Then we have Leah Moff Doglo. Is, she's a political science graduate student and a dedicated volunteer for sustainable development. She's responsible for diversity in the WWF Generation Earth Steering Committee. Also, we welcome her. Thank you for being here. And then we have Bernhard Burns Ottinger. He's a young activist, environmental management student, content creator, a creative storyteller, and he's known for his out of the box thinking. So <laughs> thank you very much for being here today, for sharing your experiences with us, for presenting what Generation Earth is doing. And on that note, I will just hand over to you and, and looking forward to have a lovely 30 minutes with you. Great. Hey, thank you so much for the invitation. And before we start, I want everybody just to take a quick stretch break. I want you to stand up, maybe shake out your arms a little bit, shake out your legs, get some blood flowing. Cause I know if you've been sitting like me, I've had so many Zoom calls today that I'm just going nuts. So everybody turn on your camera so we can see your faces. Do a little bit of side stretching, get that blood flowing if you need to, just kind of whatever you feel like is stiff and tight right now, just allow your body to get a little bit looser, yeah? Let that blood flow through it. Whatever you need, stretch those legs, stretch your arms. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so we're gonna keep the journey going. Um, you guys have had now sort of an intro um, from Valeria, uh, Val uh, yeah, Valerie, uh, to how the park service is working with uh, people. We're gonna focus on the age group of, of young adults. And so we're gonna really look at this, this idea of how do we actually get people to, to get to action? And so we're gonna focus on this topic of youth empowerment. So uh, you should be able to see my screen now, right? Everybody should see this. Excellent, perfect. All right, I'm just gonna bring my pictures over so I can see them real quick, so I can see your beautiful faces. And I'm gonna move that over, perfect. Okay, so again, if you don't mind, we'd love for you to turn on your cameras so we can see uh, more than just little black boxes and white names. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and jump it on there. And uh, please do feel free to ask questions as you did before, um, pop them into the chat. We'll try to get to them as, as, as quickly and uh, thoroughly as possible. Okay, so before we start, we want you to actually answer some questions. So um, uh, Monica is gonna pop the Minty uh, link into the chat and I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second and bring it back. So you should see the Minty um, link there. Okay, and uh, go ahead and log in to minty.com and then you can either follow the direct link that you got or you can use the, um, the code name, 10561618. And we'd love to get you guys, you can do this over your computer, you can do this over a handy, uh, over a phone, whichever you prefer. Nate, that was a bad German joke. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when you've been living in a place too long, you start to speak the language, yeah. Okay, so let's see. Uh, have you guys been successful? Give me a hands up if you're able to get on to the link, on to minty.com. Got a couple hands up, great. Okay, the first question we want you to answer is what three words come to mind when you hear the term youth empowerment? I see people are coming on, so I'm going to... Let some of those words come through. 
generation, innovative, capacity, involvement, fun, revolution, future, inspiring, boring, <laughs> transformation, capacity, phony, fun, action, activism, enabling, stupid, generation, solidarity, uh, ambition, public pressure, new, I'm curious about some of these words. I'd love to have a little bit more of a deeper discussion about some of these, for example, like, yeah, phony and boring and, uh, <laughs> and what is the other one? Articulation, stupid. These would be interesting to have a discussion. So we got about 20 people answering. Let's see if we can get up to 25, which would I think be about half of the people that we have on here. All right. So we've got 20 people answering. Can we get a couple more? That'd be fantastic. 21. Give me three more. Come on, guys, you can do it. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, you can see that the words in the center that are the biggest are the ones that were most often uh, selected. So change, future, transformation, activism, action, innovation, revolution, generation are some of the biggest ones that we see. So thank you for that. Um, now you should be able to, let's see if I can go to the next one. Okay, the next question is, what do you think people need in order to get active and or empowered? What do you think that people need? So what are some of the prerequisites that you would say? Support, motivation and determination, information, hope, Awareness. A lot of information, interesting. Support, anger, role models. Space, money, people who believe in them. Trust and self-esteem, confidence, digestible knowledge, truth in their own power. A platform to speak for themselves, courage. Financial stability, identification values, experiences, enthusiasm, respect. We're up to 21. That's great. Anyone else want to add theirs? Again, role models, knowing other people who are active, communities, emotions, confidence, platform to express themselves. Okay. So we're gonna come back to the presentation again. Thank you for joining us. One of the things that we like to do at Generation Earth is not just talk, but involve and engage. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of overview of where we're gonna to go today. So first of all, we're gonna take a quick journey back in time of who we are and how we got here. We're gonna then look at three aspects of the Generation Earth program. One is on skill building, one is on inclusive decision-making, and one is on personal and community development. These are some of the building blocks that we feel lead to, self, to empowerment, right? So just very quickly, um, it's interesting that we started off with the National Park Service because that's also where I sort of started off as a volunteer and then worked for the US EPA. And that's where I had uh, a chance to go to Alaska. In Alaska, I was working with Alaska Natives and Native Americans, and I also had the opportunity to volunteer with a group of young, inspiring people that changed my life. And it was a group called Alaska Youth for Environmental Action. This was a group that was started by six teenagers. They were between the ages of 14 to 18, and they changed the way I saw education. Education was not something that was brought in by someone and placed upon people and saying, this is what you have to think, and this is where you have to go. Education was built by the youth themselves. They said, this is what we want to learn. This is what we want to do. And the adults came and were acting as ch coaches and chaperones and mentors for them. It was the way that I think education should move forward. So in 2005, I made the jump from the US to Austria and I was looking for an organization where I could bring this idea. It was burning inside of me. I was like, how do I bring this to reality? How do I bring this here? And luckily enough, I had an opportunity to meet with WWF staff and I presented it to the education director. And she said, you know what? We don't work with this age group. We don't work with teenagers and young adults. And I was like, why? And she's like, because they're scary because they think for themselves, because they, how do you control them? And I'm exactly, that's exactly the problem. 
you want to control them. And if you try to control them, you're going to lose them. So you have to change the paradigm of what we think of education. We have to flip it on its head and start from the bottom and build it up. I brought you three experts also with me. <laughs> we saw already that uh, Monica Burns and Leah are here with us today, and they're going to also share a little bit about their, their experience. So let's just jump straight in. So if you haven't noticed already, Generation Earth is different. We ain't your normal training program. It's the bottom up principle that makes us different, which you'll hear more about. It's the fact that it's all about community. And it's all about providing a safe platform for people to explore their passions, interests, and drive to drive change. We aren't your normal training program. So in the beginning, how did it all start? 10 years ago, we put out a simple message in the WF Panda magazine. We said, WF needs youth. We're searching for a few young, motivated young people who wanna start a youth empowerment program. We didn't know where we were going at the time. We just put it out there and said, come help us co-create this program. And we got it, they came. We got seven young people from across Austria between the ages of 14 to 18. And they laid the building blocks of this program. Together, we co-created the, the whole concept from the description of a colorful network of young people who inspire, motivate, educate, and take action for the future of our planet. That's who we are. It's what we do. They built us upon the values of teamwork, relationships, community, respect, diversity, nature connection, acting, not just talking, future-oriented. A lot of you guys put information as being one of the keys to driving empowerment, but information wasn't one of the keys here. You can see that. I just want to make that as a, as a small side point. But it was about learning and change. But this learning was driven by the young people themselves. And Leah is going to tell you a little bit more about how this is done. It was about connection. It was about the nature connection. It was about connection to self. It was about going deeper inside. It was also about connection to people, as we said. It's about community. And community is so important in what we do. It creates a safe space for people to try things. We, do, we try to lower the fear factor of perfectionism. We try to give the opportunity to do something new, to find yourself and to find what you want to do and how you want to change. It's about reaching beyond borders. From the very beginning, we saw that we're stronger by creating bridges across boundaries, something very true with, I think, the climate walk concept. So we started working internationally right from the very beginning. And this is actually in the National Park, Gasoisa. And it was clear that these guys wanted to get active. In fact, it was so hard to, <laughs> we, we didn't realize how active they would get. So they were in the first year coming up with ways to get politically active. They were meeting politicians. They were going on the streets, doing street theater. They were taking it to a, the petition and an and. And this has been something that's come along every year. 10 years later, where are we? The community has, of course, grown and changed. We've offered a program every year, which is called our Action Leader Training, which you'll hear more about in just a second. Comes in different shapes and sizes. We adapt to the times. This is a Corona, <laughs> our Corona Outdoor Program, um, where actually one of your, or two of your uh, climate walkers were with us. But many things are still the same. So it's still about the group and the community. It's still about getting active. It's still about reaching out and connecting with people and being crazy and creative and innovative and driving change. And at the center of it is the concept of empowerment, which is where I wanna take you now. So I'm gonna hand this over to Leah for our first part, which is looking at the empowerment through the skill building process. Thank you very much, Nate. So, um... As you have heard, um, Generation Earth is different and so is actually our action leader training. And um, it's, it's more than just uh, training, it's, it's very different because we give you the control to what you actually want to learn and also you are free um, to um, decide what you want to do with that. And, um, also, um, is, it's very empowering because um, you have many opportunities as, um, 
as a participant and likewise afterwards if you finish the training you have the opportunity to become a body uh, which is what i'm currently doing so um i did the training um 2018 to 2019 and last year i became body and it's it's actually very refreshing and you build up likewise other skills which are as important as Look, we may have lost Leah. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so um, during the training, um, it's um, it's very nice to also have um, some skills in life, especially, sorry, Nate, <laughs> the slide just went too fast. Oh, is it still, is it, yeah, it changed? Just, yeah, it's, um, it just went, but it's okay. It was, Maybe you can just hold it because yeah. I was just talking about this. Okay. Thank you. So um, to um, build important skills, for example, you learn how to work in a team, uh, how to do an environmental project and how to create awareness, how to do social media, how to um, require um, financial aid. So you learn actually a lot. And also you learn more about WWF and you kind of have experience in working for them and together with them, which is very helpful, especially when you want to go the um, path of a career in the environmental sector. And during the training, you also, um, get guidance from uh, the bodies and also um, Nate, for example, and other experts from WWF, but also other fields related to the topic. So each year we have a new topic. And for example, this year it's um, food and climate. So you kind of will become an expert in um, sustainable diet. And also, you get empowerment, not only from a body, for example, but also from the community, because Generation Earth is a huge community with different projects. It's not only the action leader training. So, for example, we have a political action team and a social media team, and everyone is welcome. So um, you, you will feel how you are actually growing as a person in an active community and which is together building a better and sustainable future for everyone. And also you get a lot of support with your, uh, with your project and build friendships. And also you make important uh, contacts for the future and you will always have people who will like to help you out and actually the most important skill you will learn is um, that um, you actually can be the change in the world so if you want to change something it always starts with you and if it starts with you you can also create awareness in other people and so you can change the world too Thank you. Great. Okay, so now we're going to go to the next component. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, we're going to go to, to Burns, and he's going to take us through empowerment through decision making. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Leah. Um, so empowerment is also, we heard it already from Nate, um, is about making your own decisions, making your own decisions for yourself and not being dictated by any big brother or something like that or WW Austria in that, in that sense. So um, in the middle of, of our approach to this, um, there stands our steering committee. Three of, of the four steering committee members are here, are present. Um, Tobias isn't here, but um, I think I can greetings to you all from him. Um, and in this middle, we are, we are these four people and we are elected. We are actually coming from this community um, and we are elected directly by the community and do it voluntarily. We do not earn anything like um, by doing it um, rather than experience and a lot of um, other things. 
they actually help us in life. And what we what bounds us together is we want to see something, we want to do something with Generation Earth. We want to know, okay, where we want to head with Generation Earth. We, how do we want to grow and evolve with Generation Earth? But actually maybe not in size, and, but also in quality. How we make uh, Generation Earth even more inclusive, how we can get more people from different uh, backgrounds, for instance, which are the worst thing that we is doing it now at the moment, or how we can actually make our community more um, bound together, how we can actually celebrate more, et cetera, et cetera. So in the middle, we have the community, um, the steering team, uh, but we are not alone in, in this in these decisions, but we are in constant contact with, uh, still with WWF Austria. Um, we have um, in our monthly meetings, we constantly have also people, WWF staff with us, who are uh, supporting us, who are actually giving us um, advices on different topics, who help us in, in a certain way, and um, where we can actually um, phrase even um, wishes for collaborations, where we can actually phrase some different uh, ways of how we can actually communicate and link together and do things together, so as a symbiosis, sort of. And where at the same time, we are not only doing this with WWF, but we are in constant contact also with all the rest of the community. And for that, for instance, we are very transparent about our meetings. We have this um, the update videos where we um, actually update everything that happened in our meetings. And we have also other like approaches and different ways to how to communicate with our community. Um, for instance, what is shown in the, this picture um, there in the right bottom um, is actually our in the inch media called the Forge of Ideas. Basically, it is uh, coming together with everybody who's interested from the community who has ideas and interests in different topics and who want to actually talk with others about these ideas. If they want to form a project team together and make a project about this, or if, they, if somebody actually searches for an idea who actually had no idea yet, but he wants to be inspired by other people. And last time we also had a nice, nice, really awesome um, workshop about work-life balance and all these different like you know um different informations and inputs and inputs from our community come together on the on the forge of ideas on the inch meter where we actually celebrate each other and actually learn from each other so key learning is a big effect there and we're in constant um in constant contact but still we're not there yet we are not this is not a fixed idea or situation where, where we now stand but we want to involve. We also want to evolve the decision making, the involvement. So what we we actually have now with uh, of our steering committee member Tobias, um, we have this now this new called um, structure team where we think about okay how we can actually make generation F even more inclusive, even more transparent, and we're thinking about making a plenum um, where we can actually um, get to all everybody together when there's a big decision coming up. And, and also other um, involvement. So we want to be even more diverse with as a group and keeping people also together. Because after all, this is also something, also a learning process for us to be very informative with everybody in our group and be in actually keeping it up with everybody and be updated with everybody on every decision we want to make. And this is something we are all living for and we are passionate about. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. So as you can see, we we bring the the process of including um, the young people into the decision from from the very beginning and also uh, continuing through through today in decision making. Okay. The last part is we heard uh, quite a bit about the the community, and we're also going to look at the the topic of per personal development here too. Get it over to Monica. Thank you. So yeah, as you may have read, we are a youth network. We're actually not like a known like institution, um, but we are a network. And so we have this problem that a network without the net doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so for us, it's like super important to keep this network going um, because we found out that um, the more we are connected and the more we spend time together, the more we talk to each other or the more we discuss problems, the more project ideas will come up. Um, so without coming together, without having this feeling of community, we're 
basically only like individuals. But what we need here is being this group and being active in this network. Um, and yeah, I mean, alone people, maybe you have experienced that yourself, um, alone people often feel lonely or senseless, um, but in a team you can reach so much more. So strength comes from within the team and um, from the cooperation um, that really encourages. And that's actually we've, like something we found out in the monitoring and evaluation of our action leader training as well, uh, where people wrote like the most important uh, like feelings or, or ideas they, they took away from the action leader training and the community was one of them. So in this one year long program that really is about leadership, about project management, about, about different, um, yeah, environmental topics, what the people kept in mind after this one year is the community. Um, I mean, for sure they took away all those skills they learned, but still for us, it is very um, essential to know that this community is of so much value in the team. And yeah, that's uh, one of the reasons why I, I am the steering committee am very much taking care about the community and we yeah, have like a, we put a very strong focus on that. And I, with you, I just want to do a very short exercise right now, um, which is in the Zoom, try to grab your neighbor's hand. So whom you can find, take grab someone. So we actually try to somehow have a network because yeah, in the end, everyone should be connected to at least one other person. <laughs> can we do that? I have one. Did everyone found a partner? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> cool. So uh, I guess you were much more happy when you found a partner than when being alone. Um, and that's uh, yeah, the same thing in, in, in our network in Generation Earth. So Nate, you can go on. Ah, you took the screenshot, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, and uh, one way how we found out to keep the community going um, was to reconnect the people with the people um, by offering different like events um, and forms of events. So we came up with community talks, community events and community walk and talks. So the community talks um, are a format where people come together now on Zoom because it's Corona, yes, um, but um, can also be offline and they just share. And sometimes we do have experts calling in, talking about the very specific topic. Sometimes we just let people out of the community talk about their own. Um, Oh, yes, we're running over. It's okay. Um, about their own topics. So what, for example, uh, we heard was media usage in times of crisis or creating online spaces or about women in WWF, about sociocracy. We had lots of diverse topics there as well. Um, and for the community events, we um, offered councils, parties, excursions, different things, and walk and talks that's um, self-explanatory um, when we were like outside hiking and offered people uh, a, um, a space to talk and to have chats. So yeah, that's the different events we offered. And on the next slide, -da 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 -da. Oh, one again, once again, Nate. Yes, exactly. You see it's again um, events made by the community for the community. So it's this very like bottom up process where we the young people decide for ourselves um, what we want and how we want to uh, create and design our own program. Great. Okay, so we're just going to come to a conclusion again. So if you have your, uh, if you can go back to the Minty, I don't know if you still have that uh, still open on your, um, oops, just go out of here for just a second. Uh, if you still have that open on your phone or whatever. And you should have one last question, there you go. Um, so 
I want you to just reflect because reflection is one of the big things that we also focus on with the Generation Earth. So it's not just going from one activity to the next to the next, but it's also giving you set some time to say, okay, what have I actually taken away from this? So I'd like you to think about what are some of the biggest take home messages or learnings that you've made just from this last uh, session? Um, what, what stands out in your mind? What, uh, what will you take with you from um, the presentation that you've heard? So take a few minutes. Community empowers and enables actions. Community. You can't control the youth. I love it. Keep engaging with your community. Community is important. Walking really makes you think, I want to participate. Everyone can be part. Community feeling very important. Bottom-up decisions are important. Connecting, networking, and community, very important factors. It's all about community. The information is already there of what to do. Now it's about getting together. We can be the change. Youth groups can be fun and should be available and accessible to children who want to engage. We need to change the education paradigm. Love it. Liveliness is key. Youth aren't only about Snapchat and Instagram. Perfect. That we are not alone and should rely on community to change things. Community is so important. Youth are so powerful. Great. Let's see if we get a couple more. Hopefully you guys didn't fall asleep on us. <laughs> Got a lot of good responses here already. Okay, two more seconds. This is your last chance. All right, good. Well, thank you uh, very much for um, your time. Um, I don't know if we have any, if we have a little bit of time for questions. I don't know if we can go over. Um, please feel free to stay in touch with us and please do stay in touch with us. So you can find us on the web, of course, you can find out more information about our training programs, um, lots of different inspiring stories and um, project descriptions. Um, you can see how the steering committee is set up, et cetera, et cetera. It's in German and English. So that's at the website. And of course, over social media, you can find us from uh, YouTube to Instagram to Facebook. And of course, if you wanna get in contact with us, send us a message at info at generation earth at um, yeah, and with that, I will see if there's anything you guys have. I know we, we don't want to keep you over too long, uh, but of course, we'd love to also have a chance to hear what, you, what you're what you thinking about. What questions do you have? If you'd like to have a, one of us specifically answer a question, you could just pop the person's name in there as well. So. If you want to unmute and even ask it with your own voice so we don't have to read it, that would be even more uh, appealing. So feel free to just, if you want to turn your microphone on, let's hear your tomorrow, voice wherever you are. Tomorrow is World Voice Day, so it might be a good occasion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No questions. I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. <laughs> I think it's a good it's a good sign. Oh, there is a question. Okay, coming. now they're coming in. Yes. Could you give us a give us a concrete example of a project you're proud of? Well, I'll turn this right over to um, the the speakers or the, the speakers, the Generation Earth members. Anyone want to address that? Uh, one, maybe just do one project that you're especially proud of. I can tell one. I'm especially proud of actually um, about the um, crossing paths driving change one because it was such an it was an Erasmus Plus um, funded uh, project and it was such an <laughs> uh, let's say um, such a rough path actually to get back to the funds and by actually then getting them it was such an a relief and we felt okay now we can do everything we achieved this and now we can go everyone i mean and it was in the end it was a very very enlightening event so we had different so many different countries uh european but also um countries like bhutan there in hong kong so it was so amazing to meet actually these people and so so different it's actually it's different and it was so that's something you do not encounter on a daily basis. So it was, this was such an, uh, such, uh, such an experience and memory I keep in my heart forever. So this is an amazing one. This was a 10 day, 14 day 
How long was it? 14 day, I think it was. 14 day yeah. training that they invited. I think there were 30 some people that came from, yeah, as you heard, not just from Europe, but also all around the world to a youth empowerment training so that they could experience a little bit more about how do you, how do you really empower and what are we doing across different countries? Learn from each other, super. Yeah. yeah. There's another question. Do you see tendencies of who is participating? Is it gender related, education related? Well, we just talked about that again today, <laughs> Monica or, you know. Today in our steering committee meeting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> our um, M&E pro found out that um, basically it's mostly students um, in our program. Yeah, I mean, all of us here um, are students as well. And uh, gender related, I'd say it's probably more women, but um, yeah, maybe a bit equal, but more women. Um, and definitely students. And that's why we also started um, now having like a diversity strategy. And it's really like, we're really into opening up the, the green bubble, but it's really hard. So in case you have a good tip for us, share it with us. Um, we struggle with reaching people out of the green bubble. <laughs> And uh, gender wise, I mean, I don't know if you mentioned this, but it's, I would say it's also about 75 to 80% women, which yeah. for me, it's perfect because the more women we can empower, um, we can get some of these old um, stubborn men out of office and put the women into power. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, um, we'll try to see if we can pop the uh, link to the, I think we're coming to, yeah, here it is. I've got the project here. So I will just, there's the YouTube and here's also a, a little bit of report on, on the project, which was called Youth, uh, Youth Workers Training. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for, for presenting what you're doing. Thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for once again, emphasizing the importance of community. That's also what, what the, the whole Climate Walk project is very much about, about you know, creating communities, about getting together and about you know, jointly changing things and not being there out, out there completely on our own. So thank you very much again to all of you for being here. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences and insights. And if there are no further questions at this point, I will hand over to Ria, who will, who will close our class today. And, and I wish you already a very pleasant evening and see you soon. Thank you. So what a great fourth session this was and our exciting journey in learning more about climate change will continue next week again. And next week we'll put the art lens and focus on our scientific um, cameras and hear from different speakers how art and photography can show us new perspectives on climate change. So we'll dive into a completely different topic and look at the same topic from a different angle as we have done every week now. So we'll learn hopefully how do visual arts perceive the changes and how can they help us to understand these complex changes in a better way? Um, if you have any questions regarding the, the course formalities, then just check out the Moodle platform or write an email to Martin or myself. And in the meantime, I think I can only wish you a good week and I hope that you can go on many lockdown walks and enjoy the nature that we learned about today. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Bye. Good luck on your journeys. Bye -bye. Happy trails. Bye-bye. <laughs>